Ladies and gentlemen, buckle your seats. Here we are for day three. It's the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences of the Northwest University and we are highlighting our postgraduate product offering. Today we're going to focus on environmental, biological and agricultural sciences. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now looking at the School of Biological Sciences uh, of the Northwest University and they have a wonderful focus ranging from biology, microbi... In fact, let me ask the experts to tell you a little bit more about what they have on offer in the School of Biological Sciences. I have with me here the Director of the School of Biological Sciences, Professor Sarina Klaasen. Sarina, thank you for taking the time to tell us a little bit more uh, about your school. Uh, what do you guys focus on? Kleeple, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So in biological sciences, we start the undergraduate programs with three main disciplines, botany, zoology, and microbiology. Then when we go to the postgraduate programs, it becomes a bit more diversified. So we take the biological sciences and we articulate them further into uh, more specialized biological science subjects, but also into biotechnology and environmental sciences. And where do your students end up then, career-wise? Uh, I assume some of them stay in the academia like you, but uh, yes. others end up in, in doing research, or, or what do they do? Yes, so research institutions, um, those vary widely, uh, associated with universities or not, and then also um, quite a number of uh, companies that work in the environmental field, and then also companies that have an environmental responsibility, such as your ESCOM, SASOL, um, all those big players that we often hear about. Mm. So environmental sciences quite strongly, and then for the biological sciences, we have um, often laboratories where students are employed to ensure quality processes, quality checking, for example, water monitoring, um, other environmental monitoring, all kinds of um, things like that. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to the, the careers and, and how a, a postgraduate degree can contribute mm. to your career. We'll get to that a little bit later on. Let's just start with what you have on offer. Now, you offer postgraduate qualifications uh, uh, on, on the different campuses of the Northwest University. Yes. Let's start with the honours programmes on the Potchefstroom campus. What do you offer? Okay. So, yes, um, we have on the Potchefstroom campus uh, honours, masters and PhD programmes. In the School of Biological Sciences, we offer a, an honours qualification um, named the BSc Honours in Environmental Sciences. And this is divided into four different programs or curricula. So students may choose one of these programs based on their um, interest and what they perceive themselves to be experts in one day. So all of these um, honors programs can then later articulate into masters and PhD programs on the Potsdam campus, but also at other universities. And for the Masters and PhD programs on Potchefstroom campus, uh, Prof. Carlos Besaynot, who is the Director of the Unit for Environmental Science, Sciences and Management, um, will tell you a little bit more. So in terms of these four programs that we have um, for the Honours in Environmental Sciences, the first one is Ecological Interactions and Ecosystem Resilience. They have quite long names. Yes. Um, we abbreviate this one as AIR. <laughs> so there's also a biodiversity and conservation ecology, aquatic ecosystem health, and then integrated pest management. But these all have obviously different focus, focus areas. It, you know, it's as if you end up somewhere else after completion of the degree. Yes. So it is a more generalized degree, the Environmental Sciences BSc Honours. Um, it's not discipline specific as you come from your undergraduate with something like zoology, botany or microbiology. But these uh, disciplines that we have undergraduate strongly support the subjects that we present in 
this honors course. Mm. So it is a more general course, but there is in these different programs a bit of a different focus. All four programs are structured in the same way. It is 128 credit curriculum and it is made up of elective modules and compulsory modules. Uh, one of the compulsory modules is a research project uh, which counts uh, 32 credits of the total program and this um, students can talk to a supervisor about before they um, apply for, for the honours and this also articulates then sometimes more strongly into one of the typical undergraduate disciplines such as zoology or botany. So it's still a year full-time study, right? Yes, it's a one-year full-time study. Um, we also do accept students part-time. Um, then you do the degree over two years. And um, at some point, you will just have to come to campus to do some work on your practical project and to give some presentations um, on your mm. project. But we do accommodate uh, part-time. So of the, of the four degrees, are there any you'd like to highlight? Yes, um, especially the Integrated Pest Management Program. So that program is specifically designed around crop protection me measures and um, it has a strong focus on an integrated approach. There we also focus strongly on the pests um, that are associated with agriculture and crops that we plant in South Africa. It makes us the only uh, university in South Africa that has a strong nematology focus. And this um, program and the graduates from this program is very sought after in the agriculture sector and in the job market. Then the other program I would like to highlight is the one in aquatic ecosystem health. So here we also train students um, in a broad range of aquatic monitoring skills and they then go on to work in um, the environmental field in water quality and water health related areas. Mm -hmm. In the Aquatic Ecosystem Health Program, we also have unique uh, subjects such as the nearshore marine and estuarine ecology uh, program. This is a living lab program that happens at the Tsitsikoma National Park over seven days and we also have two international universities and one local university, the University of Johannesburg, um, that participates in that program. So we have lecturers and students from four universities that go along on this trip and learn these skills in the field during that week. I've heard of this. There are a few videos doing the rounds yes. of... of uh uh, of this thing, you know, I was I was interested in it because the degree is offered in Porch, but it's a near shore thing, and obviously we're not near the shore. But now with the Titicama yes. contact, I uh, understand. Yeah, and at least we can travel to the shore, although it takes us a bit more time than <laughs> some guys living near the shore. But yes, if if any potential students are interested, they can um, go on YouTube and search for Titicama Living Lab you will find more than one uh, video there that has information and that shows what the students are doing during that uh, seven day excursion to Tsitsikama. Thank you, Sarina. Uh, now that uh, allows us a bit of a, an understanding into the programs offered in honors uh, at the Porchestruum campus in the School of Biology. Now we're going to uh, jump over to Muffy King and uh, on our Maikeng campus, we have Dr. Madeleine Struwig, who will tell us a little bit more about the Honours Programme, Biology with Botany. Madeleine, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Okay, so on the Maikeng campus, the students do Honours also in just one year, and they can take three subjects, um, the or four subjects. The first... Um, the first semester has the subjects of ecology and plant taxonomy. And in the second semester, the students also take ecology and then plant biotechnology. And then throughout the year, the students also do a research project. So Marlene, uh, it's a, it's a full-time full study thing, right? Or do you also offer it on a part-time basis? Um, yes, full-time or part-time. 
part-time. All right, and you'd like to have them uh, on campus. I, I can only assume that there's a, a lot of work uh, involved in laboratories and so on. Um, the research projects need to be done um, on campus, so students will have to come to campus. Um, but the subjects they can do online um, and come to campus if needed. And do you still accept applications? Um, applications is open for next year. All right, thank you. And uh, they'll all do that uh, online. I, I assume all nine applications available for you if you want to do your honours in uh, biology with botany at the Maiken campus. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to jump over to uh, 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 another expert at the Maiken campus, and that is Dr. Hazel Mufandu. Dr. Hazel Mufandu will tell us a little bit more about the honours in microbiology. Uh, Hazel, thank you for your time. Tell us a little bit more. Uh, yes, we do offer honors uh, degree in, in microbiology. It's referred to as the Bachelor of Science Honors in Microbiology on Mahigan campus. It is a one-year degree where the student has attained their undergraduate degree. And during this program, we offer a more specialized uh, module. So, and these are run by uh, specialized or experts in their field, lecturers that are uh, specialized in, in their you know, experts in their own field. And uh, the students will also be introduced into uh, research methodology as part of their research study. They should know how to write a project proposal, undertake research project, be able to also analyze uh, the results that they've gathered in the laboratory. And at the end, they must be able to even write a mini dissertation. So yeah, that's about it. Uh, and we do offer this, um, uh, honors, like I said, for um, one year, and uh, we have modules that uh, go hand in hand with the research project. And these modules uh, in the first semester, there's uh, two modules. Uh, one is referred to as the bacteriology, and in this module, they'll be told, uh, taught, uh, I guess, a lot about uh, what bacteria do. You know, pathogenic, nosocomial bacteria how they affect us as human beings and so forth. And then the second module in the first semester is uh, also, uh, uh, that, that is offered in the first semester is uh, called virology and immunology. And this delves deeper into the vir viruses, you know, how they affect us again as, as human beings and uh, the immunology aspect, because these go hand in hand, the immune system, viruses attack in the immune system. And then in the second semester, we have a mycology module, which is a study of fungi. So again, how does fungi uh, uh, affect us or how is, does it uh, contribute to the ecosystem out there? And then the next uh, module in the second semester is the environmental and industrial microbiology. Again, looking into uh, you know, bacteria you know, in the industry, especially the food industry, you know, how does it affect the plants that we grow and for us to get vegetation and so forth. So those are the modules that are covered on my game campus in the, in the honors degree. Thank you, Hazel. Thank you for that detailed description of the honors degree in microbiology uh, offered at the My King campus of the Northwest University. If you are interested in one of the honors programs, just visit the website of the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences and you'll see there is a tab uh, indicated uh, 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 where you'll find all the deadlines for applications in uh, our different honours programmes. But we're also going to talk a little bit about the Masters and PhD programmes, specifically those offered at our Maiken campus. And first I'm going to talk to Dr. Tsehu Di Kobe. Uh, and Tsehu, tell us a little bit more about the, the kind of research that you focus on. Uh, thank you. Uh, in Mafiken campus here, we offer a master's and a PhD in biology, specializing in uh, plant biotechnology as one of my, re as my research uh, focus. Uh, mainly in that particular research, we focus on uh, 
plant research stress systems, uh, mainly in uh, indigenous crop systems, indigenous crops such as marama, amaranth, and others. Uh, mainly in there, we focus more on the abiotic stresses. These are various stresses uh, that affect our plants, and also they affect the crop yield and also the biomass uh, yield that would uh, really uh, affect our, that would really affect uh, the proper feeding of uh, the growing population. So mainly those are various abiotic stresses. They can include uh, drought, uh, high salinity and others. So there are various approaches that are used there in that uh, particular research, uh, such as uh, uh, checking the morphological aspect, the biochemical, the physiology, and also the proteomics of those uh, stress response that are exhibited by those indigenous crops. Mainly, uh, there's a particular research also as uh, mainly motivated by the need to develop crops that can uh, withstand uh, these uh, various abiotic stresses and also to enhance food security in general. Thank you. So it sounds fascinating. It's, uh, it's really an incredible wor world that you operate in. Um, uh, I assume that it is taxing. I mean, a master's or a PhD within your your field of study is not something to be taken lightly, uh, is it? It's not. It's a really interesting project, especially for a master's. Uh, you can just take two years to do that uh, with extensive uh, laboratory research-based project and also for a PhD, three years uh, of intensive uh, laboratory research. Thank you so much, uh, Tsehu. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to tell you a little bit more about the different focal areas that we have when it comes to masters and PhD. And now I'm going to ask Professor Peter Marlam to tell us a little bit more about the areas that he focuses on. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for your time. Uh, tell us uh, about the research that you are engaged in now. Okay, we are in ecology, we are doing um research in communal areas to improve the livelihoods of the of the local people living there and uh, due to the unsustainable ways of farming uh, a lot of problems escalate for example that we very often have is bush encroachment in these areas and um, the bush encroachment of course have a, a big influence on uh, the livelihoods of the people, uh, making the rangelands unsustainable and people cannot farm there anymore. Um, there are currently about 40 species, plant species that are encroaching in these areas. And uh, every year, some of these species are, are taking off the list, but there are other species also starting to encroach in these areas, especially Species, for example, the thorny shrubs like uh, sickle bush and, and so forth. And also, there are big problems like, for example, invasion of alien plants. And our work uh, entitles, of course, field work. So the students are involved in field work practices uh, where they are going to the field and um, look at the particular problem, analyze the problem, and then at the end of the day, um, the major uh, objective is to uh, make the livelihoods of the people better staying in those areas. So there's a lot of field work that is at stake and it gives the opportunity for the students to work in the field. Peter, uh, so if someone is interested uh, in working within your field, I mean, if it's encroachment of different plant species or or uh, having a look at, at, at something like food security and so on. Uh, what do they do? Do they uh, first apply or do they engage with you a little bit to hash out a theme? 
Yes, of, of, of course, the first thing is um, to do a master's and a PhD degree. You must first go through the, the normal processes of getting your honors degree. And in the honors degree, there is the basis being laid for further studies. And then uh, they apply for a master's degree. And before that, they, they come to the particular supervisor. And then we explain the type of work that we are going to do. So there is a, a application process that is at stake, yes. Peter, and how do you go about in finalizing the research proposal? I ask because quite often I see that if the research proposal is nicely set out, then it's a much easier journey, you know, in, in terms of completing the full dissertation. How do you deal with the research proposal? Oh, yes, the research proposal is very important. We as a department, uh, uh, the, the, the process basically works like this. The, um, the students set up the proposal with the help of the supervisor. And then we as a department sits together and uh, we evaluate the student and the proposal. And if we are happy with that process, then uh, it is being referred to the school. So uh, the department it goes, in other words, through the hands of the supervisor, through the hands and the eyes of the department, and then eventually to the school. And once it's being approved by the school, then the student can proceed in doing the project. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Peter. We really appreciate your time. Uh, Dr. Hazel, I'd also like to hear from you about the master's and PhD uh, focal areas that you have. Uh, tell us a little bit more, Hazel. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, with the Department of Microbiology on Mahigan campus, we have specialities uh, in, uh, for, for master's and PhDs, specialities in water and food safety. Uh, we have soil and plant microbiology, we have mycology, and lastly, virology and immunology. And I guess uh, I'll talk more about the virology and immunology as I'm the one that is heading that uh, research. So what we do in this research, uh, as it uh, talks, uh, you know, explains it itself, that is viruses, study of viruses and, and the immune system. So we need uh, for students to qualify as PhDs. I mean, after going through the program, they will qualify uh, at the end after a PhD as either a virologist or an immunologist. And uh, we have uh, currently um, looking at uh, projects that are focused on hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, herpes simplex, uh, HIV, and the co-infection of the two of herpes simplex and HIV, and now also getting into the uh, COVID uh, uh, research SARS-CoV-2 virus. And as we know that uh, due to the pandemic and strict regulations with COVID, uh, microbiology on mapping, we are not yet at the stage of uh, getting samples of COVID, but we do this with our collaborators in uh, at the NICD and also at the CSIR. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we also have another expert here in our midst focusing on microbiology. He's uh, Professor Collins Ateba at the Mai King campus of the Northwest University. Collins, tell us a little bit more of what you focus on. Yeah, I also uh, work in, in microbiology here at the Mapiken campus. Uh, my work is, is it's, it's focused on um, antimicrobial resistance and looking for potential solutions that could address this issue of global concern. Um, we look at pathogens that infect, uh, that contaminate food products, water, uh, as well as um, clinical samples from, from, from hospitals and, and, and also clinics. Um, we look at a number of pathogens, but most, most recently, our work has been centered on uh, looking at uh, bacteriophages and proposing them as uh, potential solutions. And uh, we have a number of collaborators on those projects from, from, from the USA, Canada, um, Italy, just to mention a few. And what we do at masters and PhD levels is to 
to train our students to be able to understand hands-on techniques that would be very beneficial at the, at the job site. So basically that's what we do in a nutshell in my lab. Thank you, Professor Collins Ateva. Thank you so much for telling us a little bit more about your field. Uh, and of course, uh, you are open for applications, right? Definitely, we are open for applications, but it's, it's a bit tricky this year um, because we still have a few students who are still in the lab that were affected by COVID intake, but yes, we are open for applications. Thank you so much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard from all the experts uh, and uh, Sarina, uh, I can only imagine that people in your field uh, are really sought after. So they would most probably enter into the market in South Africa, into the job market, with a, with a bachelor's degree. Uh, what would motivate them to do a postgraduate degree? What would, what would be the difference there? Kepler, that's a very good question and um, it is true that there is a need for scientists in South Africa. The difference between having just a three-year BSc degree and having a postgraduate qualification is that you distinguish yourself when you have a postgraduate qualification from a lot of other people that exit universities with a BSc degree. So we are not the only university presenting BSc degrees in environmental sciences and biological sciences. There are other universities in South Africa that do the same. So we have quite a number of graduates every year that qualify to um, work in the scientific industry. However, as I say, you distinguish yourself when um, you have a postgraduate degree. And that distinguishing factor is um, both in the specialization that you choose, so you gain more knowledge and more skills that are applicable to a specific field. Um, we mentioned, for example, the Integrated Pest Management Honours Programme, which is specifically tailored to the agricultural sector. And then um, there are other um, specialisations that would position you for work in other environments. So also the other important thing is that you usually progress further in your career when you have a postgraduate qualification. That is not to say that you have to do your postgraduate qualification immediately after your undergraduate. Uh, for some people it works best to obtain their BSc degree, go out and get some work and then after a year or two when they see where their interests lie and what their company expects from them, they can do an honours or a master's or even a PhD that is appropriate to their career plan. Mm. And you have so many experts that uh, people will most probably come to you with a, with a challenge or a theme and you will have the expert to guide them. Yes, so all of our projects are based on current environmental problems. Uh, whether it's in agriculture or water quality, uh, Prof Collins also mentioned antibiotic resistance, which I'm sure everyone has he heard of by now. Mm. Um, Dr. Hazel mentioned various viruses that they are working on, such as HIV and now even the um, uh, COVID virus. So very relevant um, research that is going on. And I think the evidence of that also lies in the unlimited, I almost want to say, numerous publications in mm -hmm. international journals of high standing that both our staff and our postgraduate students publish. And that speaks to the relevance of the research and the work that we are doing at Northwest University. And it also contributes uh, to our position in the job market. Prof. Sarina Klaasens, Director of the School of Biology. Thank you so much for your time, really appreciate it. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, those are the postgraduate degrees on offer in the School of Biology at the Northwest University. Now, ladies and gentlemen, hold on to your seats because we're talking about the School of Agricultural Sciences. And uh, it's a school with quite a broad focus and uh, experts that will intrigue you and keep you engaged and make you want to, in, to do that postgraduate degree that you have in mind. 
We're going to talk to a few of the different experts in the school, uh, their focus areas, the kind of research that they engage in, and then also the postgraduate product offering that they have, all those different postgraduate post qualifications that they have on offer. We're going to start with Professor Hilda Mokoboki, and uh, Professor Hilda focuses on animal science. Hilda, thank you so much. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, my name is Professor Kwena Mokoboki from uh, Animal Science Program. I'm a subject group leader for Animal Science Program. So uh, Animal Science Program trains learners in the science and production of livestock. So we are having several disciplines in animal science, such as animal breeding and genetics. We are also having animal nutrition, animal reproduction, and production physiology, meat science, and pasture science. So the program, it has got, in fact, the NWU, it has an experimental farm where the students will conduct research, but we are also making use of collaboration with other institutions. So animal science goal, our main aim of animal science is to offer an opportunity to students from different educational backgrounds into a sound and applied science to become professional animal scientists within the agricultural sector and other related industries. So in animal science program, since I've already explained that we are having major discipline, we are having 10 academic staff and all of 10 academic staff, they hold PhD, all of them. So we are having also students under each of the 10 academic staff. So our academic staff, we do have uh, those who are specializing in animal breeding. We also have pasture scientists, uh, animal nutritionists, and when we when I talk about animal nutritionists, I am referring to monogastric nutrition and ruminant nutrition. So, and again, some of the projects that we are doing in animal science. So they do fall under the discipline that I've already talked about in addition to nanotechnology. So we are also having a research project which do fall under nanotechnology. So for collaboration, since we are under research, we are working with several institutions for collaborations. And our collaborations, we are also working with Stellenbosch University, whereby we do have the meat science and what project. We are also working with Stellenbosch University again, because we do have an academic staff who is specializing in wildlife research. So uh, the academic staff who is specializing in wildlife research, so he's doing a collaboration with Stellenbosch University. And we are also collaborating with a department within the institution, such as microbiology, chemistry, crop science, and animal health. So we also have collaboration like the University of Fort Hare, and we are also having other collaborations such as SunBio, China and University of Free State. Thank you very much, colleagues. Professor Kwena Mokoboki from Animal Sciences, thank you so much. Uh, and of course, uh, I assume, Professor, that you are still open for applications for people wanting to do a postgraduate qualification, right? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are open for, for MND students. And since I've already explained that uh, we are doing very well, our students, they are working like in National uh, Department of Agriculture, like DAF. So they are working after completing our MND studies. Thank you so much. All right, now we're moving on from animal science to agricultural economics. And the expert here that we're going to hear from is Dr. Simon Letsualu. Uh, Simon, thank you so much for the time. Tell us a little bit more about your world of agricultural economics and what the kind of research studies are that you focus on. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Agriculture economics, uh, it's a broad, broad discipline. And um, luckily at our university, we have the FIDA discipline, which is a BSc agriculture economics, which is four years. And uh, it is rated at honors level. So student after that degree, go straight to the masters. And the masters is MSc agriculture economics, which pay, deals mainly with the um, uh, globally food security issues. I'm talking about the economics of production, the economics of distribution of the food and processing, and ultimately the utilization of uh, the, the food material. So it is a broad uh, entity. It's a broad program, which almost runs into every agriculture aspect, because as a farmer, you have to know the economics of your farm, as a producer, you have to know how much are you making and how much are you putting into the production uh, system. So the agriculture economics is definitely about the costing and effective of uh, running the agriculture per se. Now in my department, in our department, we have um, the straight MEC uh, agriculture economics. In other words, if somebody has a BSc agriculture economics or has honors in agriculture economics, then it's admitted straight into the masters. But there are instances in agriculture economics where you have people who are coming from other disciplines. For example, people could be coming from animal health, crop sciences, or animal sciences, and they would want now to proceed with their career postgraduate in agriculture economics. So what happens is that they are accommodated, we admit, we admit them into the postgraduate post diploma agriculture economics, because that gives them now enough background to tackle the masters, the MSc agriculture economics. Now, like I said, the researches that we are focusing on in agriculture economics are mainly belonging to the big family of food security. We do the on-farm you know, uh, transaction researches, on-farm production researches, and that's what we welcome when students apply for, 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 for the MSc. We also look at management general because agriculture economics is also about managerial functions. We are talking about the planning. We are talking about uh, you know, drafting and writing uh, the, the, the business plans and so forth. So in our research, we are saying this must be improved with time. You know, it must, it must meet the, the demands of the time. Business plans that were formulated in 1912 may not be applicable now. So that's why we need more research in, in such, so that we can develop and move on. Um, in, in the postgraduate, I'm talking about the, uh, the PhD, which we offer after the master's is that uh, a student has to contribute to the science. He has to really come up with something new that has never been heard of before. And uh, so that you know, we can have new models so we can have new strategies of doing things. I'm talking about a wide range of things in the food security entity. And basically this is what we do. Now they, uh, going back to the uh, diploma, it takes a year. So once a student has uh, finished all the five modules that are prescribed, then he proceeds to the master's, which takes a minimum of two years. And then from there to the PhD, which takes a minimum plus minus two years to three years. Uh, so that's what we are doing in our department. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. That was a fascinating uh, perspective on your field, quite a broad area that you cover in agricultural economics. So thank you very much uh, for your contribution. 
We are now moving over to crop science and we're going to talk to Dr. Dimpu Elephant. Uh, Dimpu, thank you so much for your time. Tell us a little bit more about crop science. Thank you for having me. Crop science, the main focus is the crop, the plant that we produce. How well can we grow this plant and how can we get more of the plant to make sure that we feed people? We understand that currently there are issues of food security. So there is a demand to find ways to produce more food that will feed a lot of people. But crops are not just to feed people. Animals need to crop as well. So we've got a lot of disciplines within crop science that look at the different aspect that ensures that we can produce food and we can produce food sustainably to feed the increasing population. Now, one of the disciplines that we have is plant breeding, where we look in the ways in which we can modify the crop so that it can produce more food. It can tolerate some of the adverse uh, environmental effects. It can also resist some of the diseases. That is your plant breeding. But we also have plant protection, where we protect the plant from diseases and from other pests. And then we have soil science, which focuses on the environment in which you grow your plant to make sure that you can, um, you can apply fertilizer, know when to apply fertilizer and not to apply fertilizer to minimize the issue of traffic that can cause compaction. We also have agronomy. So when plant breeders have produced these good varieties of plants and good cultivars, agronomy will look at how these cultivars will then perform under different environments. And then we have horticulture that focuses on the horticultural crops. Currently, the research that we're conducting varies between these disciplines. For instance, in plant breeding, they are looking at the different lines of your open crops. An example will be your amaranthus, also your nightshade, looking at how these different lines will perform. In plant protection, currently there's other research looking at using your cell phones to detect the diseases that are found in your citrus, uh, uh, your oranges, your soft citrus, and so on. In soil science, we're currently looking in how we can improve the productivity of small scale farmers. For example, there's a student looking at how we can use eggshells as a lambing agent. The other students are looking at converting domestic products into useful products such as your biochar. And then in agronomy, some of the research we are conducting is looking at those nutrients which have been neglected. For an example, uh, for maize production, most people have neglected zinc. So we're looking at how we can combine zinc with nitrogen fertilizer in order to improve the yields. And then in horticulture, we've got research that's looking at using gray water to produce your vegetables. So these are the researches that we are currently doing. So for masters and PhD students, we welcome them to apply, uh, to get uh, accepted into a master's program. You need at least a 60% average in your honors year so that we, you can be accepted into your um, MSc in crop sciences. For PhD, you need to have a master's. We also do accept people who are coming from related fields e.g. people who are coming from Botany, they can also be accepted in our postgraduate program. So these are the things that we do in um, crop science. We also have collaborations with our colleagues within the university, but also with also external colleagues. An example would be your ARC. There's currently a project that we're doing with ARC in Stellenbosch, where we're looking at the use of winery wastewater but also there is collaboration with ARC in Pretoria, looking at the different uh, breeding programs. So these are the things that we do within our programs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dimpu. It's a, a fascinating world and uh, it's incredible to think that a simple concept such as crop science really covers so much. Thank you so much for your contribution. Now we're going to hear a few words about the Center for Animal Health Studies. I'm going to talk to Professor Mulunda Mwanza. Professor Mulunda, thank you so much uh, for your time. Tell us a little bit more about the center. Good day. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. 
the Center of Animal Health uh, Studies or the Department of Animal Health, uh, Northwest University, uh, train students in different, in various um, areas. And I would like first to go back in the history of the center. The center has been created under the, with the aim of training students or graduates who will be able to assist the Department of Agriculture in their uh, aims and, uh, and view. And the, the, uh, the most important aspect of their training is to participate in the control of animal diseases in terms of prevention, studies and detection, and uh, finding solutions to the problems which are occurring, such as new outbreaks, new diseases, the impact of climate change on the occurrence of new diseases or the variability of, uh, this, of these diseases and movement of, uh, uh, of diseases due to climate change as well. So the Center of Animal Health is, every, uh, is training under degree, uh, undergraduate the degrees uh, and diploma. The diploma, they, uh, they can upgrade and do the degree. And once you have a degree, the students can apply for, the, uh, for a master's or a PhD or any other studies which have been related to animal health are accepted into the Department of Animal Health or in the Center of Animal Health Studies. Some of the area, the key areas where we do our work here in the Center of Animal Health is the uh, animal health diseases, microbiology, parasitology, epidemiology. We do uh, work in the um, food control, food safety, uh, food safety, food control, food microbiology, food safety, uh, uh, food uh, toxicology, and food mycotoxicology. Some of the current projects are mostly related to climate change, where we look on the impact of the climate change, as I said earlier, on the impact of climate change on the um, zoonotic diseases. And most of our research uh, in collaboration with the Department of Agriculture and Forestry DAF, where we participate in their uh, in solving their problems, and we do collaboration with uh, the University of Pretoria, the Understood uh, Biological Products Institute, UNISA, ARC Understood, SunBio, uh, the University of Glasgow, the University of Missouri, and other universities around. We work in, in good collaboration with uh, all our other departments, such as animal science and uh, uh, agriculture extension as well, because we have projects which are interrelated. Um, the center has uh, seven academic staff who are supervising, and most of their studies are, are, are related to what I've said. That means the uh, food microbiology, Epidem uh, animal disease epidemiology, animal disease, um, animal disease uh, control, and participate in this, trying to get the solution to problems which are occurring in terms of animal diseases. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to Mulanda. Thank you for telling us a little bit more about the Center for Animal Health Studies. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you've seen it. It's uh, quite an extensive range of topics covered by the School of Agricultural Sciences at the Northwest University. If you want to know more about them and about their postgraduate offering, please visit their website. Ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to focus on the School for Geo and Spatial Sciences. Uh, they actually have quite a broad scope, and I'm not saying that just because they focus on geography as well. But they have several experts here in the field with an array of postgraduate offerings uh, from the school itself. We are going to uh, talk to a few of the experts about the different programs, but first I'd like to talk to Prof Dirksel here about the school itself. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the school. So the School of Geo and Spatial Sciences consists of three subject groups. 
um, across three campuses. So on the Posh campus, we have geography and we have geology and we have urban and regional planning. So urban and regional planning, we won't really be talking about today because they've got a four year program, which is a bit different from the rest. But on Mafi King campus, we have geography as well and the same for Fall campus. I must say geology, it's also, as part of geology, we have soil science now. It's not a separate subject group yet, but it is developing into that. So in the future, it's my understanding it will be a separate subject group. But for now, those are the three subject groups that we have in the school. So in your research as well, you focus on geography and geology. Myself. Yourself and the school. So there's programs that integrate geology, well, ge geology and geography. Um, but not necessarily on the postgraduate level. So there we tend to split into geography honours and geology honours. Mm. And then you, you do basically localised studies on the geography and geology of South Africa or do you also have a broader perspective? So a lot of what we do is, is local, um, but there are some studies definitely that looks internationally as well and regionally as well specifically. Mm. All right, Dick, thank you. Let's get an idea of the different uh, programs involved and, and uh, of which areas you specifically focus on once we get to the postgraduate environment. Uh, we're going to start off with honours and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the product offering on Van der Bale Park and Mahi King uh, on our two campuses there. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Sheldon Strelung to tell us a little bit more about the honours in geography. Sheldon, welcome. Tell us a little bit more. Thank you very much. So, uh, on the Mafeking and Val campuses, we have a BSc Honours degree in Geography. It's a one-year full-time program, so you will attend courses throughout the year. They will hopefully be face-to-face -face contact. Um, for our programs, we have two compulsory modules. That would be the Research Report, which is a year-long module where you choose a topic of research with a supervisor and throughout the year you work towards the completion of that research project. The second um, compulsory module is a research methodology module. This we offer in the first semester and it forms part of our orientation for the new honours students. And in, within that module, we take you through the various research methodologies, the various schools of thought, and basically how to do your research project. So those are our two compulsory modules. Um, for our elective modules, we are split across three various subject groups. We have a physical geography component and a human geography component. We also have a very strong focus on geographic information systems and remote sensing. So there are a number of modules for these students to choose from. Within the first semester, there are four total modules to choose from and the students will have to choose any two of those modules. The information is online and in the second semester there is also a total of four and the students have to choose a, an additional two modules. On the VAL campus there are additional modules so their numbers per semester might be a bit higher but um, the point is that there is a wide variety of subjects to choose from falling across the physical geography, the human geography, and then remote sensing and GIS fields. So we are still open for applications. Um, at the Mafeking campus, we usually try and limit it to around 20 to 25 students. So it is very competitive and honors students should always know that the workload going from third year into honors is quite a big jump. So they need to be prepared to do a lot of reading, to do a lot of writing, and they will have to present, so don't be scared, but we look forward to the applications and we look forward to a productive year. Thank you. Thank you, Sheldon. Yeah, that was the Honours in Geography on Van, uh, uh, Van der Bell Park and Mai King campuses. Uh, but Dirk, you can also do the Honours in Geography on the Poch of Surum campus, right? Yes, so the Honours in Geography in Poch, we call Geography and Environmental Management Honours. So. The big difference there, I would say, is that we've got a strong focus on environmental management. So the structure is more or less the same, as Sheldon just discussed. So we have a research project and there are two compulsory modules on our campus. The first one is also research methods. And then we have one that's introduction to environmental management. So students have to take those modules. And then we have a list of 12 electives of which they should select four. 
and they vary quite a bit. Um, a lot of them are environmental management focused, like environmental assessment, environmental analysis. There's also some disaster risk models in there, and then the more geography models, um, and also a lot of air quality. Um, so we've got an air quality focus in our subject group as well. So there's air quality uh, management in there, there's earth observation, GIS. Um, so there's a range of models, and students select four um, to make up their program. And yeah, applications are also still open um, until the end of October, and they can submit on, online, and we should be able to tell students if they are successful around the end of November. Wonderful. That's just in time to make plans for the next year. Exactly. Yeah, thank you, Dirk. Uh, but we can also do a, an honours in geology uh, on the Potsdam campus, and I'm going to ask Ms. Sasha Rupa to tell us a little bit more about the honours in geology. Uh, Sasha, over to you. Um, thank you. So um, the honors in geology, for you to do that um, course, you have to have a major in geology for your undergrad um, and an uh, alternative um, major. What we do in our courses is environmental geology. That is what we focus on. And the students will need to complete a mini dissertation, which comprises of a research project, um, with lab work and field work. Then there are two compulsory modules. The first one is environmental geochemistry and the second one is rehabilitation. Um, and then the elective modules are, um, there's two geology modules, which is environmental mineralogy and applied geology, as well as um, any other modules that the student might be interested from other streams. So anything from GIS to um, physical, chemical, and biological characteristics of water. Um, it can come from both the School of Geo and Spatial Science, as well as the School of Biological Sciences. So they will have six modules and then a research module. Um, lastly, the applications close end of October. We will finalize that in November and let the students know um, the outcome by the end of November. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Sasha. Wonderful to hear from you and about that honors program. Now we've covered all the honors programs. Let's move on to the master's degrees. It's uh, something different in itself. Uh, let me start with the Ma MSc in Crop Science. We have Professor Rulof Berger here. Uh, Rulof, tell us a little bit more about that MSc. So uh, we have quite a few specialists at the Northwest University that focus on agriculture and, and crop science. And uh, that program is a, a research dissertation. So students that have some kind of an undergraduate degree in, in soil science or agriculture can apply and look to do research in that field. Um, the, the best way to do that likely is to uh, look on the Northwest University website and to find the experts that are, that are currently in the system and then to try and see who you would want to have as a supervisor. Mm. And then to engage with them. There's a a whole conceptualization process that takes place, right? Even before you apply for admission. Sure. So on your application, you have to state who your uh, potential supervisor is. And then you also have to state some kind of a, a research topic. So uh, uh, different than the undergraduate and honors degrees, mm -hmm. you actually have to approach the university with, with a very clear understanding of what you want to do and who your supervisor will be. So a lot of interaction with potential supervisors is needed for you to get into a program. Mm. I should also say that there's a very uh, strict competition for these degrees and a minimum of 65% uh, for your undergraduate degrees and honors degrees would be uh, needed to get into a program. And then, uh, you know, that uh, negotiation to get a supervisor to accept you is sometimes a, a tedious process, so don't give up too soon. Make sure you, uh, you swoon your potential supervisor and uh, <laughs> that might get you into the yeah. program. Yeah, and, and the crucial factor is your writing ability, right? Your writing style, you need to be able to write that full dissertation. I mean, you're, you're not going to swoon them with, uh, with chocolates. They're interested in your, 
your yes. competence. So writing is maybe the most important skill set for postgraduate study. Yeah. But then there's also other kind of skills. Anything that you bring to the table that's special um, is important. Sometimes it might be uh, existing experience in the field. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've got some uh, uh, prior employment that you can show that is not on your ac academic record. So anything that shows that you you have the potential to finish the degree, degree in good time mm. and that you will be a good student will be enough to entice uh, a supervisor to mm. take you on. Mm. Okay, thank you, Rulof. Uh, we're going to talk to Rulof some more a little bit later on about some of the other master's degrees and also the PhD. But now it's the turn of Dr. Darnell van Tonne. And uh, Darnell is going to tell us a little bit more about the MSc in geology. Danelle, thank you for your time. Thanks, yes. So the, the master's degree is actually not called geology. It's in environmental sciences, but we specialize in geology, of course. Um, so the degree is a, um, a research project. So you'll have to do some field work. There's um, a choice between various different focus areas. So because we focus in our honors on environmental geology, we also have focus in environmental geology in our masters, but that does not exclude you doing a very pure geology, for instance, doing geological mapping and um, doing very hard rock geology with analyses and, and your um, theory about how rocks were formed. Um, so we would like students to contact the student, uh, the, the supervisors. Um, and again, on the website, everybody with their specialization fields are, are listed. Um, yeah, so we, we prefer students do it full time, but there's a lot of students that is working. So they're doing it part time. It's more difficult because you do need to spend a lot of your um, free time working on a dissertation. So we would prefer students that does it full time. And then there's lots of different fields in geology and uh, combined with soil science and even combined with other subjects like um, botany or zoology that we will consider. A lot of the time the students also have no idea what exactly it is that they want to do. So they would approach us with an idea or that if we have an idea, we would be actively looking for students. Um, but there's also some instances where a person that's working have the advantage of working in a field where they can use maybe a project that they are currently working at work to do their masters in that. But yes, we are excited to see new ideas and so on. So we would be glad to listen to students with new and exciting ideas. Thank you so much, Darnell. Really appreciate it. I love the, the openness towards a multidisciplinarity as well as an openness to some real in-practice uh, uh, examples and, and themes uh, that you might consider for that, uh, that master's degree. Uh, Rulof, but there's also, we spoke about geology now, there's also an MSc in geography, right? Yes. So, if you like open uh, thinking, then geography is probably the field for you. Uh, we, have a, we have two options for, for registration in geography, although that's not that important. Once again, for postgraduate studies, the most important thing is finding a supervisor. So if you're interested in um, atmospheric science, uh, climatology, uh, climate change, air quality, uh, in, uh, environmental management, maybe a, a, a mix between biodiversity, environmental management. You might be interested in disaster risk reduction, waste management, um, any of those topics. We have good expertise at, at the university. Um, and then, you know, we, we could take you on as a, a master student. And uh, in our programs, the, the previous degrees are not that important. So if you 
if you are trying to make a move from an, uh, another discipline and you're interested into solving real world applied problems, geography is likely the place for you. Um, and then as long as your marks on, are good, you would be able to uh, make a, a slight sideways shift in your career. Mm, that's wonderful because the, there's often a question about how do I get in, you know, the, in, into the program. And it's wonderful that you consider um, uh, people from different fields. Uh, but that's the masters now. On a, on a PhD level, there's a, there's a difference now in the kind of work that you do, isn't there? Sure. So the, the difference between a master's and a PhD is, is likely in the fact that the PhD, you, you're trying to aim for originality. You need to add something to the body of knowledge. So uh, I'm sure students that has a, a current uh, master's degree will appreciate that fact, right? So the master students, it's you, you come and you just have to show that you can do research and then we'll give you the degree. But for a PhD, it's a very lonely journey. And although the supervisor is very important, it's uh, most of the time it will end with you being alone in the dark in a very bad <laughs> space, trying to, uh, to try and to put something together that people can say that's a unique uh, bit of research. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a different kettle of fish um, and something to consider very uh, carefully before you attend. But uh, uh, it's also something that can change your career path immensely if you can if you can manage to get that mm. over and done with. Mm. So, Dirk, you've been through it all. I mean, you've done the master's, the PhD, and so on, and you've also experienced this difference that Rulof spoke about. You know, the the masters being you know just a master of the science, but then there's a little bit extra coming to the uh, PhD. Definitely, um, I think, especially because I'm now. Uh, at the university, I'm, I'm really thankful for my PhD promoter at the mm -hmm. time because um, he kind of left me and I had to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to come up with proposals. Um, I had to come up with ideas, with, with methodological solutions and, and all that. And that helped me develop into an academic that I can run my own research project and, 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 and do the research and, and write it up. So that's the PhD journey, I think, and that's our expectation also um, mm. is to, to uh, and that's what we want to teach students as well, to be able to, to do research independently. Mm. Um, that's really what's expected at the PhD level. The supervisor or promoter will be there um, to guide when needed, but it's not like the masters, you know, where they are more involved in, in the design of the study and, and, and making proposals as to, you know, things like study areas even, or, or what's the methodological approach that should be used. At PhD level, we expect the student to come with the mm -hmm. um, solution almost. You know, mm -hmm. that's what I want to do, because you're building your thesis. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And, and, you know, we often get asked, why should I do my postgraduate qualification? And you've basically answered it now, because uh, you, you are really engaged in the theme. Mm -hmm. and, and if you have a specific problem in practice, uh, you can actually work towards current literature that, that would have answers, but you can also generate yes. a very unique answer. Yes, exactly. And I think that's, especially at the PhD level, that's the expectation, mm -hmm. to generate that knowledge and contribute. And oh, it's a privilege to be able to do that, to be able to, to make a contribution to knowledge. Mm. Another reason to, to pursue postgraduate studies is that you might have lost your job, you know. So it's, be it's much better to to build your skill set and work on yourself mm. than to sit around and do nothing. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's quite a few reasons why you would want to uh, pursue postgraduate studies. And it's a very personal thing. It might be different for, for different people. But uh, students should know it's a, it's a significant commitment. M smaller so for a master's, but still, uh, it's still a significant commitment. And especially if you're looking for part-time study, it can take a big chunk out of your life. And then for PhD, it, it will be a traumatic experience, no matter how you approach it. <laughs> Rulof, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about what to do now. I mean, if someone is interested, uh, uh, let's, let's focus on the higher degrees, on a master's and a PhD. How do they start that process now? So it's, it, could, it can be a very frustrating process for uh, poten potential students because, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, your process actually starts with you having somebody that says, I'm willing to, to be your supervisor. It might not be your final supervisor, but to get into the system, to be able to register, 
you need at least one person that say, I will be willing to be your supervisor. And uh, in, in South Africa at the moment, there's a, a very big uh, supervision load at most universities. Mm. So when you approach a, a potential supervisor, and especially if it's a, 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 one of the better scientists that's got a really nice profile, you must know that that person probably have too many students already. And uh, it's much easier for, for that person to delete the email or to not answer the phone. So, so when you approach a potential supervisor, you, 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 you need to do that with that in mind. Your, your approach is very important. You, 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 you know, you have to come with a great CV. Uh, you have to come prepared to show that you're both uh, skilled but also enthusiastic about your potential degree. You have to convince the person that it's, it, you won't fall out halfway through. You know, for PhDs in South Africa, the statistics is about 50% of PhDs don't finish. So when supervisors evaluate potential students, all those things are at the back of their mind. And you as a potential student should make sure you convince that, that uh, guy that, or, or, or lady that you are the best student that they will ever have. Now, how should, should you do that? Let's, we can talk of a few things. Um, I, I think the first I, I've mentioned is you need to have a, a, a very good CV that lists not only your academic achievements, but any experience that might be valid for a postgraduate study. Uh, the skills that super supervisors would look for is firstly writing skills, uh, some evidence that you can write well and unassisted uh, you know, work. So the second thing would be skills in your sp specific area of interest. It might be technical skills like with a computer, GIS, uh, programming, uh, or it might be practical, like working with instrumentation, doing certain kind of field work, um, and any kind of evidence that you can dig up from your past uh, ex uh, interaction with uh, the world at large will, will help uh, with that. Then uh, another thing that's important is funding. Uh, a supervisor need to make sure that students are financially uh, okay. So when you approach a, 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 a supervisor with funding, it's much easier to get accepted. Mm -hmm. So if you have been pursuing funding opportunities and maybe you've, you've, you've found a bursary, that will be uh, something that counts a lot. If not, approaching a supervisor with a plan to fund yourself, like seeing funding opportunities and saying, listen, I want to apply for this funding opportunity. I need a supervisor and a topic. Can you engage with me? That's also a great way of convincing somebody that you, you will be a good student. Mm. And then lastly, you have to be clear about whether you want to study part-time or full-time. You know, it's, the supervisor will need to plan around that. So those kind of details is all that is needed uh, before he will or she will consider you as a potential mm. student. It's a, it's a lot of homework. It's a lot of work done even before you start. But I've also seen it time and time again. If, if you do that well... The, the journey that follows is clear, you don't mess around, you don't add another year of study because you're not focused, etc., etc. Exactly. You know, if you ask most uh, academics in the country whether they have space for another student, they'll say no. <laughs> but if you pitch up and you're a great student, it's like a South African taxi, they'll always fit you in. <laughs> and that's what you need to do. You need, you need to convince them that you'll be a great, supervi great student that you won't run away halfway mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. and that you've got the enthusiasm and the, the support to, to finish your degree. And maybe that will, will, from your side, it will need you to, to pick up the phone or actually come to the university, Poch, Val, or Mafi King, make an appointment, mm -hmm. look the, the person in the face mm -hmm. and convince him that you'll be a great student. Mm -hmm. Maybe That's just to add on, I think, at the master's level as well, but especially at PhD level, show the supervisor you did the reading, you know, and come with a proposal, or even if it's not the one that's going to be used at the end, but show that you've put in the effort to, to um, get to a research question that you can present to them at least, and show that you read up on the topic. Mm -hmm. um, so show that you already started to engage um, with the area in which you want to do your study. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. Uh, and your wisdom. Thank you for all the advice and I'm sure that it helps once we start talking about your postgraduate degree 
specifically so thinking about the School of Geo and Spatial Sciences. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the best units uh, in all aspects at the Northwest University is the Unit for Environmental Sciences and Management. It's a, it's a very broad and far-reaching unit, but it's also a top-performing unit. And we're always proud uh, uh, of the postgraduate work that they do within the unit. Uh, we're going to tell you a little bit more about the, uh, the unit and in all its aspects. Uh, but let's start with uh, an overview of the unit. We have the director here with us today, Professor Carlos Besaidno. Uh, Carlos, thank you very much for availing yourself. Tell us a little bit more about the unit. Thank you, Hippia. Uh, the Unit for Environmental Sciences and Management um, is made up of uh, eight sub-programs. Uh, and the various sub-program leaders are here and they will be... Uh, expanding more in terms of the actual research that is being conducted. But we do offer uh, specializations in uh, a Master's in Environmental Sciences, uh, as well as a PhD in Environmental Sciences. But then there are also the uh, traditional uh, Master's in Zoology, and Master's in Botany, and Master's in Microbiology that is offered, as well as a uh, Masters in Geography, uh, the same with the PhDs, um, but uh, the various sub-program uh, managers will specifically speak about the details of those studies. Mm. Now the golden <coughs> thread amongst all these different focus areas would be the environment, right? So they all come back to something within the environment. Absolutely. And um, the research that we conduct is, is integrated research so uh, that uh, we deal with the environment, but specific aspects of the environment. Mm -hmm. For example, the climate change uh, and atmos uh, atmospheric chemistry group focuses on the atmosphere, whereas um, the um, ecological, uh, aquatic ecosystem self uh, focuses on uh, water and, and, and subsurface uh, water uh, quality and, and various aspects mm -hmm. that occurs within it. Uh, and so we, we can go on, but everything is focused on the environment. And then we have environmental management, which sort of brings everything together, which looks at policies, etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, very exciting mm -hmm. uh, options that are available within the Unit for Environmental Sciences and Management. And, and as a director, you are in the fortunate position to oversee all of this, so you must get into contact with all these students and supervisors and so on. What would you say uh, would motivate someone to do a master's or a PhD within this unit? What, what is the value added? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the uh, focusing on the environment uh, brings together uh, more than just the discipline the, the, the single focus discipline sort of encompasses uh, much broader um, aspects of, of sciences um, and uh, the value that, that you add to society, the value that you add to the country um, and internationally, absolutely. And, and, and that is what uh, we pride ourselves in, is that um, our students get this opportunity to uh, to study with um, leaders in the field locally as well as internationally. And they also get the opportunity of attending conferences mm -hmm. and they publish in, um, in high impact factor journals. So the work that they conduct is more than just um, a dissertation or a thesis. Uh, it actually gets published and it contributes to knowledge, to knowledge creation, new knowledge that is, it is, being, uh, is being created. Um, nowadays, with, um, with the competition that there is uh, with uh, individuals that uh, attended um, a technical um, university, uh, that uh, people coming in and, and, and doing a master's or a PhD sort of 
qualifies you to really make a major contribution in your, in your chosen field. Now, uh, Carlos, thank you very much. It's uh, wonderful to have had you here. Uh, we look forward to seeing a little bit more of uh, the unit that you are the director of. Uh, congratulations on the excellent output uh, and the excellent excellence that you have within the unit. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's make a start with Professor Sarul Sohir, uh, who has uh, an interesting take on Ayer. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard about the unit. Uh, Carlos gave you a nice overview. And now it's time to delve into the specifics of all the different focus areas that we find within this broad unit. We're going to start off with a, a, a very interesting field. Uh, I, I suppose so because of the acronym that we get to, Ecological Interactions and Ecosystems, uh, Ecosystem Resilience. And, and that brings us to AIR. <laughs> we have uh, here with us uh, Professor Sarul Salia, and he'll tell us a little bit more. Sarul, thank you for being here. Thank you, Hip. Uh, I can assure you that we are not a bunch of AIRs. <laughs> uh, this uh, um, sub program is uh, characterized by a quite a diverse group of scientists from two different schools uh, and five subject groups uh, the groups of botany, microbiology, zoology geology and soil sciences. Um, and um, in terms of the research, the 22 scientists in uh, this sub-program also have quite a lot of, of, of different types of research programs, uh, quite variable. Uh, there are the different research groups. I will very briefly just uh, touch upon each one of those research groups. But the research uh, that they are doing is fundamental and applied, which uh, is also in line with the needs of industry government and also the people on the ground, uh, rural as well as urban uh, communities. Uh, the, the core theoretical uh, base of our research is resilience thinking. So you might think, ask what is resilience thinking all about? It is basically uh, the core theoretical approach that we use uh, in, in all the different research programs in terms of the ability of, of systems uh, to absorb uh, disturbances and still retain their basic function and, and structure. And the systems that we are studying uh, are first of all organisms, uh, animals, plants, as well as microorganisms, but also different ecosystems. Uh, right through from degraded or disturbed natural ecosystems, uh, agro-ecosystems, uh, urban ecosystems, also industrial ecosystems, in, including mines, for example. Uh, and uh, uh, St students studying masters or PhD uh, courses in these different uh, res uh, research uh, sub-disciplines will be able to, to find jobs at agriculture, conservation, uh, also in terms of industry and, and the urban sectors. Uh, I will just very briefly go through the different uh, research groups. The first one is about uh, arid and semi-arid grasslands and savannas in terms of the degradation thereof um, and a degradation uh, because of grazing but also because of bush encroachment uh, and studies of how bush encroachment can be controlled and how the areas can be restored are done uh, and then two very important aspects of this research group is monitoring in other words they monitor uh, how well those uh, areas are uh, have been restored and then also feedback to the land users, uh, which are uh, usually then small as well as industrial farmers. And they all form part of sustainable land management. The second uh, research group uh, is, oh, second research group also studies rangeland management, but in the more uh, moderate or uh, more temperate areas. Uh, and they don't focus on so much on grass, uh, grasses and uh, shrubs and, and, and trees uh, like the, the, the previous one, but they focus on forbs. Forbs are non-grassy herbaceous species, uh, and that it, it makes this uh, research group really very unique uh, because there are not a lot of studies on the importance of forbs uh, to uh, contribute to the ecological uh, uh, integrity of uh, grasslands and savannas. Um, lots of field work, just like the previous one, and uh, people who are able to identify plant species, in this case, forb species, 
uh, are uh, sought after by wildlife management, uh, the wildlife management sector, and there you can also see quite a lot of different type of surveys that they are doing uh, in the field. The next one is uh, urban and settlement ecology. Uh, that is the study of urban ecosystems in terms of biodiversity, but also the ecosystem services that the biodiversity uh, fulfill free of charge to human beings to increase their human health and well-being. And we uh, focus on studies along different socioeconomic gradients. So also what is the influence of uh, people of different socioeconomic status on these aspects. We are working very close together with planners uh, in terms of green infrastructure planning. And we've also uh, developed uh, guidelines for green infrastructure planning uh, for South Africa. Uh, job opportunities, uh, local governments, uh, large cities uh, nowadays uh, are, are looking for urban ecologists to working in large teams uh, with planners and with uh, engineers and environmental managers. Then we are moving to the this uh, more the micro field, uh, the smaller organisms in the soil ecology ecotoxicology and microbiology research group. Uh, the, the focus is on uh, the interaction between policy research and industry, and then also what is the impact, direct and indirect, of human activities on soil ecosystems. Uh, and in those uh, studies, they, they look at the effects of pollution on the soil ecosystem. They use earthworms, for example, as bioindicators. They also study uh, the microbiology component of the soil, uh, and also use uh, various analytical techniques. Job opportunities, uh, something that I can, in can, can include here are uh, mines. Uh, so lot, quite a lot of jobs in terms of uh, environmental safety. So with the microorganisms in agricultural microbiology and envi uh, environment uh, bi uh, biotechnology research, uh, the, the focus is also on basic and applied studies, but uh, the problems associated with agricultural important crops uh, and also the resilience of agricultural soil. Uh, and they focus quite a lot on food security, so job opportunities in terms of food and agri uh, agrochemical industries. And as you can see there, uh, the apparatus that they use in laboratories are, are quite interesting and complex, uh, so they do a lot of, of laboratory work. And in the next group is also about uh, microorganisms in the microbial diversity and pathogen genomics group. They also study microbial communities, but they focus more on the pathogens. Uh, in other words, those organisms which, uh, which cause illnesses of uh, animals and also of humans. Uh, and they use uh, advanced molecular techniques uh, to do these type of studies. Uh, laboratory based all the all the time and you can see uh, examples of some of the techniques that they are using all right back to the uh, the field uh, the geoecology research group is uh, uh, where there's an integration between vegetation scientists and geologists and they focus basically on things like biodiversity patterns and interactions between between plant and, and soil uh, and uh, students who are interested in plant, soil, and, and, and geology, which can't uh, decide which one of those uh, they want to, to, to know more about, uh, can choose this research field because it's really a combination of all three. It involves field surveys, but also lab analyses and uh, greenhouse experiments. The last two research groups, um, more in the geo and spatial sciences, it's quite diverse and the members in each one of these groups have uh, quite a lot of different, uh, different expertise. In terms of uh, applied geology, uh, the focus is to apply geological knowledge in the study of rocks. They do geological mapping, they study petrology, they also do pollution studies as you can see there, uh, aspects such as acid main drainage is, is uh, investigated. Uh, they also uh, study rock sections uh, in the laboratory. It's quite interesting field. And then also the metal tolerance in some, uh, in some plant species. Um, in terms of the uniqueness of, of this uh, research group is that uh, their studies lead to new discoveries of mineral resources. And they also do a lot of groundwater modeling. Job opportunities is in terms of 
uh, government departments, also mines and also uh, consulting engineering and environmental companies. And then the, the last research field is also quite, quite wide, the Agricultural Soil Sciences Group. They focus on agroecosystem health, uh, things like sustainable cropping systems, digital soil mapping, and they are involved in research in position, uh, position farming. Uh, there you can see some of the uh, apparatus that they use. They mount it on, in front of a, of a vehicle and in, in such a way they, they map the soil. Uh, and job opportunities is mainly in terms of different aspects of agriculture. Professor Saar Salia, thank you so much for that overview. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful field of study, I should say field, uh, and uh, I'm sure that many masters and doctoral candidates uh, would be interested. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Prof. Sarl, and uh, it's wonderful to hear about the ecological interactions and ecosystem resilience uh, that's happening uh, in terms of scientific study. Next up, we're going to hear a little bit more about disaster risk management. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a golden thread that runs through all these different focal areas, and uh, uh, Prof. Sarl has just spoken about uh, ecological interactions and ecosystem resistant, resilience. Uh, and now it is time for us to, to speak about a, a field that I think is also closely related, but I might be wrong. Let's, let's see. We'll talk uh, to Professor Diewald van Niekerk about disaster risk management. Uh, Diewald, thank you so much for availing yourself. Straight off the bat, I know that your master's degree is quite popular because many students speak about it. Mm -hmm. You also have a postgraduate degree uh, uh, or a postgraduate yeah. diploma yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, in the field. But first, let's, let's start by telling us uh, what your focus is all about. Well, it can be very true. It, it's a very multidisciplinary focus. Uh, we, we talk about transdisciplinarity. So what we try to do with disaster risk studies is to look at... Um, solving real-world problems from, ver from various disciplines. And the real-world problems we focus on are obviously the disaster risk issues. And uh, we tend to be a home for many people, um, whether you're coming from public health or public management or something like environmental management. Um, so we try and mix the social sciences and the natural sciences as well. Um, and the main focus is to uh, look at disaster risk and why people find themselves in situations that um, exploits them, basically. Mm. So in, in the, the, the name disaster risk management, uh, the, the, there's a major focus across disciplines on risk management. How does the disaster risk fit in? Well, disaster is something very specific. I think nobody knows more about the Disaster Management Act than South Africans at this stage. Um, so disaster has got a very specific definition to it, and that relates to any situation that exceeds our ability to cope with it using our own resources. So any risk linked to that is what we, we focus on. Um, so our main focus is basically in two components. The one is a more natural environment where you look at your natural hazards, like you would have your felt fires, your cyclones, uh, earthquakes, if that is your geographical area, um, etc. But then uh, from a more social science perspective, we try to understand why people are vulnerable to certain circumstances. Um, there's not much you can do f <coughs> on a, in terms of a flood that happens annually in, in a certain river basin. But surely you can do something about people um, settling within that river basin. So that's the social component with, that we uh, try to address more. But obviously you need to understand the natural processes as well. And this is where we fit quite well in with um, environmental sciences and management and we bring more like the social science perspective to that. Mm. So the transdisciplinarity brings with it multiple methodologies, uh, you, you, it, it's mixed methods, quantitative, qualitative, right? Absolutely. I mean, you can have people working on uh, GIS modelling for a certain hazard that we could give you answers. And you can also work with people uh, looking at indigenous and traditional knowledge um, and how that helps us to solve disaster risk issues. Mm. Um, I've even had students who were looking at it from a music perspective, looking at how um, oral traditions and music are used to convey certain messages of disaster reduction. Mm. So it cuts across all disciplines. Mm. It's quite an exciting field, but it also needs you to understand as a lecturer and as a researcher quite a lot, which is mm. not always possible. Mm. And that's where we are very fortunate to be in the unit and we can draw on the expertise of other disciplines. Mm. So tell us about those uh, qualifications you have on offer. So first of all, we've had a, we have a, a postgraduate diploma, which is a bit more uh, practice oriented, um, if I can say that. 
uh, but it's also on the same level as an honors, as an honors degree, <coughs> in that we have six um, modules that you have to take. It's all compulsory, and then a research project um, as well. After you complete that qualification, it gives you entry to MEC if you have the minimum qualification or the minimum um, grade, which is 65 um, average. Then you can carry on with the MEC in disaster risk science as well. Many of the people that enroll for that specific degree um, qualification are people working in practice already. So you might have people that's already um, qualified with a, a MA or MEC degree, but they want to further their knowledge in disaster reduction. Um, but we see more other uh, students coming from the environmental science um, field and uh, natural sciences that find disaster risk interesting and they want to carry on. So they focus on that first and then they do an MEC and from that they can, if they've got that qualification, they can also go into other MEC fields if that allows them um, to do so. But many times they do focus their research on a certain component that they um, taught, were taught undergraduate and they feel comfortable with like <coughs> maybe something in agriculture or so. Mm -hmm. um, and then they carry on with, with that later on. It sounds to me as if, as if there's a strong managerial leadership policy development element in it as well. Yeah, it is. I mean, personally, um, my field of, of study uh, it relates a lot to with policy um, and so on through the whole uh, value chain of disaster risk, you know, from the UN right, right down to local government in South Africa. Um, and seeing that I started the, the African Centre for Disaster Studies kind of followed me with that. But that's not the only thing. Um, the policy is just the one, one component there often. If you can't implement that properly, then everything falls by the wayside. So it's a very important component. But there's so many more um, elements that we, we do focus on. So it's not only just that. Um, the management component, yes, there's I mean, the pure management of it. Um, in South Africa, a lot of people work within disaster management centers at local, provincial, national level. And there they need those kind of skills because they be, do become managers. Mm -hmm. So they do need to understand that environment as well. Mm -hmm. Are you still open for applications? Yes, we do. Until end of October, we are still lenient because a lot of people are waiting for previous results or they work full time. So mm. please do apply online. Yeah, and uh, and they should contact you if they are interested in a uh, in a specific theme for their masters and even mm. for the PhD. Oh yes, I mean with all postgraduate studies at the university, it's very important to first make contact with a study leader if you can. Um, talk to someone, uh, you know, assess out what you, you want to do, see if the person, or we do have pe people within the centre or maybe in the broader university that can actually supervise you, that's very important for us. Um, and then uh, once you have that, you, you can do your application. Our MEC, similar to the postgraduate diploma, re we require 65% entry. With the PhD, it's a bit different. We um, go through interview process because we have quite a lot of PhD inquiries and applications a year and we can't take all of them. Mm -hmm. um, so there is an interview process uh, that we go through with all the PhDs, uh, but we do contact them beforehand. If you have apply, we contact you, and if you're successful, you come for the interview, mm -hmm. and then off you go. All right, Professor Diawad van Nika, thank you so much. Uh, thank you thank for you your very time. Much. Thank you very much. All right, now we've had a focus on uh, disaster risk management, and uh, now we're going to move on towards spatial planning. You know, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm always going on in this unit about the golden thread, and I'm a bit concerned about uh, drawing a line between uh, disaster risk management, which we just uh, uh, heard some more about, uh, and getting to spatial planning. But that's exactly what we're going to do, because next up is Professor Arends Drievis, and uh, he's going to tell us a little bit more about spatial planning. Arends, thank you for availing yourself. Tell us a little bit more about your world. Thank you, uh, GPS, and, and we try and plan to move away from disasters as far as possible to be sustainable uh, for the long term. So we have a master's and a PhD program based on uh, articles as well as dissertations and thesis. It's a research study, so it's only in terms of uh, postgraduate research. There, there's no lectures involved as such. And what are uh, some of the typical themes that you would cover? Yes, Kepi, so we have various sub-research themes. Very interesting actually is in terms of sustainable planning. We look at the integrated approach towards green planning 
in terms of green infrastructure, green cities. We also have research focus areas for transportation planning on all levels from national down to local. We have a strong research theme on urban design, a sense of place. And then there's also research themes for regional policy and planning, which I myself deal with. And then we also have a very interesting research focus of campus planning, where we also look at planning education and the planning of campuses. Uh, now, Ernst, I know that you guys are doing wonderful work uh, on uh, green environment and keeping things green from a spatial planning uh, uh, perspective, uh, but you also do a lot of work unique to the South African context. Tell us a little bit more about those two. It's actually interesting to look at spatial planning in South Africa. Because of our history, we have a, a very unique spatial domain. We have cities that have unique structure and components compared to other cities in the rest of Africa and the rest of the world. So we have the, the social and the spatial dimension which differs from most other countries, although the development status is quite relevant for the global south. We also try and look at the principle within the research focus area of being sustainable, being green. We look at green infrastructure from basic stormwater management up to national policy initiatives in terms of green cities. And as previous speakers mentioned, relating to international policy as well. Now, Ernst, uh, just to close off, why would, would uh, someone in, in your field uh, engage in postgraduate studies? What is the value add that they can experience? That's a, a brilliant question, uh, Geerpje. There's a lot of companies out there that actually look for professional urban and regional planners that can also do research in the field. For example, numerous companies work on urban economic development policies. So you have to analyze the feasibility of new developments, whether it be on local neighborhood level, on city level, on metropolitan level, and we take it up to, to national and even regional level for suburban Africa and areas within the, the global south. So we have quite a unique approach whereby we combi combine various components such as green infrastructure, sense of place, up to the planning for sustainable cities and the planning for sustainable and resilient regional policies, which makes us quite different from uh, the other planning schools in South Africa. And uh, are you still accepting applications? At this time, we're still accepting applications, usually until October. Our capacity is limited, so we look at the best applications where possible. So, Ernst uh, Drievers, thank you so much for your contribution. Ladies and gentlemen, the short message is get your application in. Thank you, Professor. Now from spatial planning, we make a bit of a jump into a field that, that I'm curious about because I don't know much about it. It sounds interesting. Biodiversity and conservation ecology. To be frank, I know nothing about it, but luckily we have one of the experts here to talk about it, Professor Louis de Pria. Louis, thank you so much for your taking the time to come and tell us uh, about your world. Well, it's always easy to talk about something that you're passionate about. So, <laughs> so tell us more. What, what does it entail? What do you focus on? Okay, yeah. So South Africa is blessed with a very rich biodiversity, um, literally from the smallest to the big five. Um, people travel from all over the world to come and look at our diversity. Mm. And most people come to see the big five. 
uh, we often refer to the big six, including the malaria mosquito. But uh, um, so we have at the Northwest University a number of colleagues focusing on different taxonomic groups, and that's the biodiversity and conservation ecology um, focus. So uh, the conservation ecology, a little bit more on that? Uh, yeah. So, uh, for example, my research is on, on amphibians, but we don't study amphibians just under the microscope or, or um, behind the, the lens, it, yeah. but it's important to understand the animal in its environment. Mm -hmm. So each of the animals has got unique uh, habitat requirements, and, and you have to understand that in order to be able to conserve, uh, to protect animals. Mm. So for us, uh, the conservation is, is a very important aspect. Now, you've mentioned your own focus on amphibians. Yeah. So, uh, uh, some of the other colleagues of yours? Yes, or, we've, you know? got, we've got, actually, we've got several colleagues f doing parts, uh, bits of, of uh, biodiversity. Um, Nico Smith, for example, Prof. Nico Smith is into aquatic sciences, but he also study the uh, parasites of fish. And with him, Dr. Um, Kerry Malerba, she is working with, with Nico, um, on, and they're describing new parasites of fish. Mm. And likewise, um, uh, Prof. Henk Bowman um, is studying birds and, and uh, you know, bird ecology, but then also looking at dragonflies and wasps. Mm. So totally different taxa, mm. but, but uh, there's, ev everybody has got their interest. Mm. Uh, Prof. Oriel Tikisu focuses on um, parasites of domesticated animals and zoonotic diseases. Mm. So in other words, which of the animal parasites can impact on man? Mm. For example, you know, the, the, the sleeping sickness, the triposoma is as a blood parasite. Um, and, and he uses molecular tools to look, look at that. Um, and then in, on the botany side, we have uh, Prof. Stefan Siebert and his wife, uh, Prof. Frances Siebert, and they both plant ecologists, but still doing the ecology, it's important to know what you're working with. Mm. And every now and then they discover a new plant, and that boils down to the biodiversity again. And the same, also on the botany side, we have uh, Madeleine Strubich on the Mafia King cam campus, also looking in, at the different plants and, and tox taxonomy. Uh, it's fascinating to hear you speak and, and, and listening to how these uh, different individual subjects of study mm. form part of a greater system and yes. how these systems interact yes. with one another. Yes, right? yes absolutely. Um, now, I mentioned that I'm working on, on amphibians and amphibian parasites in the end. It's about the well-being of amphibians. Mm -hmm. But I've got another colleague, um, Prof. Shay Weldon, who was a former student of mine many years ago, and, and his passion is amphibian diseases, especially fungi and bacterial infections. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, people don't always realize, but amphibians today the most threatened vertebrate class on the globe. And, and so there are several reasons for that, but disease is definitely one of them. Mm. And so Shay is looking into that aspect. Mm. Now let's get to your postgraduate programs and, and yeah. the, the degrees uh, that yeah. you offer. Yeah, so, so apart from, the, um, in, we have an honors program where students have the the compulsory and then elective modules. I always say it's like going to a supermarket with a basket. There's a couple of core ingredients that you have to have in your basket, mm. but then the rest you can buy whatever you like. Mm. And so we've got several modu uh, um, uh, elective uh, modules. Uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah. elective modules that a student can pick and he can build himself uh, a nice custom fit package. Mm. So that's at the honors level. Then we offer the masters and the, the PhD, which aren't taught degrees, but there's a, a research 
component pl plays the, the mm. important role there. So for the masters, the student will work towards achieving uh, a dissertation in, can be done in a year, depending on the rain. Mm. Uh, we're always rain dependent for, for the biodiversity, mm. but most, most of the masters would take, I would say, two years. Mm. And then for the PhDs, um, usually three to four years, mm. um, and um, ending in a, in a thesis. Mm. We are very focused on, on students publicate, uh, um, uh, having their publications already from honors level. Oh. So, so it's, it's our aim to uh, see if we can get an honor student already publish his yeah. findings, but at the master's PhD level, um, definitely a big mm. focus. And, yeah. and I must say we're quite productive in the biodiversity sub-program. Mm. It's not often that you find people pushing honor students, uh, you know, to such a, a, a standard of, of getting their, their research component to yeah. a publication. Level. Yes, but we get the quality students. Yeah, yeah. And that is something that I always say. We are privileged at Northwest University that we really get good, solid students. Yeah. And, uh, and I've just returned this weekend from a field trip and... Uh, it's so nice to see how a student, his eyes open yeah. uh, in the field when he see the diversity. Yeah. And this morning I had a, uh, a student come to see me. He decided he wants to do a master's. Beautiful. And, and that is what the biodiversity offers. Yeah. So uh, in the honors program, obviously they apply online. They can get the curriculum and the yes. outline and this, yes. you know, take their basket almost to the yearbook and have a look at that yep. first. Uh, when it comes to the masters and the PhD, do you prefer uh, that uh, a potential student contact you first? Yes, students should never shy from contacting uh, a supervisor, and they they must realize that they never waste a supervisor's time. That's our job: mm. is to speak to students. Their careers is um, for us very important that we set them on a track and that they definitely enjoy what they're doing. Mm. So, so we prefer that students contact us, that they come and talk to us, because it is so important. Students must be motivated. Mm. They must enjoy their studies, otherwise it's, you must never do it for that piece of paper. Mm. Mm. I'm no. always curious as to why people do it. I mean, and there are so many different reasons, but you're quite right. That, Internal motivation brings yep. determination, yep. Yep. you stick to it. Yeah, Obviously, you want a student, he, he must have the honours degree and he must not uh, barely make it. You know, he yeah. must have his <laughs> must six, six, a 65. Bit of a performance. Yes, yes. But for me, it's more important to have the student with passion than the student with a with a, a distinct intellect. distinction. Yeah, I understand. Um, and, and because passion trump everything, you know, mm. that's, that's, uh, um, I, I never go around in the morning, see whose student, which, which of the students are in their cubicles working. I want them to be internally motivated yeah. and they, they must take ownership of this. Study. Yeah. Uh, Prof. Louis, thank you so much. Uh, uh, the passion is obvious here as well, and I'm sure yes, yes, it, yes. Uh, it just uh, transcends to your students. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, it was great. Thanks. All right. Now, okay. ladies and gentlemen, we've had a, a look at uh, biodiversity and conservation ecology, but all of this also happens within a context of management and leadership and futures thinking. And that's where we're off to next. So we've heard about the impact of different systems on other systems and specific research subjects within a system impacting the system, etc. Uh, now, the people we're talking to now are actually into the, the one thing influencing the other thing. Uh, perhaps I should uh, uh, take it up a notch in terms of academic speak. Let's get to the experts. We're focusing on conservation, leadership and futures thinking. And with me, we have Professor Francois Retief, as well as Dr. Rhys Alberts. Thank you, gentlemen, for being yeah, here. Uh, your world is a fascinating one. I've had the very basic introduction now. 
you're more than welcome to tell us a little bit more. Yes. Francois, tell us a little bit more about your world. Okay, thank you, Gepi. So, um, just a bit of background to this program. We, we've been running a master's program in environmental management for many years, more than 20 years now, and over the last five years, we've developed uh, areas of specialization within what we call the traditional environmental management masters. So we've got now a specialization in waste management, water management, um, and now we're also developing a specialization in conservation leadership and futures thinking, which we're very excited about. So um, I, I've got a, a short PowerPoint where I could maybe just take you through the, the rationale for this new um, master's program. So, um, so there's a wealth of literature on uh, the challenges for conservation and the future challenges, which is really what we are interested in. And um, you, if, you, if you look at the literature, it's about conservation. In the Anthropocene, it's about the new debates around conservation, conservation in dynamic, dynamically changing world. And so everybody's trying to make sense about uh, what conservation is going to look like in future. Um, and, and this is what, what, what triggered the, the sort of thinking around developing this new, this new master's program. So um, in terms of, of, of conservation, um, there's a, a number of, of relatively recent publications that sort of highlight um, the challenge of making sense of conservation, um, traditional views of conservation, and then uh, more, uh, I would say, more recent views. And um, this is, for example, a paper in 2014 um, uh, uh, that asked whose conservation was published in the journal Science by Mace. But also, I think it also touches on the, on the idea of, of why conservation. And, um, and what is being realized is that there's a pluralism of views uh, around conservation, why we have conservation, and who we conserve, conserve for. Um, and that, that's, been, that's now been a big debate in conservation. So, for example, in the Mace paper, he, he, he presents a framing of conservation over time and how it has changed from the 1960s up until now and certain key ideas, how that has changed, and also this, the scientific underpinning of these ideas. And, um, and I think what's being realised now is that actually, yes, we've had this progression, but actually all these ideas are now out there and at any one time you could have all these ideas in one place. Um, so it, it, it complicates the whole um, challenge for conservation is agreeing on why are we conserving, who are we conserving for and, and, and that's the, the sort of, I would say, the context within which we, we, we designed this course. Um, there, there, there was another paper in 2019 by uh, Chris Sandbrook et al. Uh, published in Nature that went a bit further and, and, and looked at, um, you know, what, what is this diversity of views? Um, and, and what they found is that there is actually quite a diverse uh, a spectrum of views around conservation and the future of conservation. And um, it's illustrated by the data in, in this paper that shows that your views of conservation varies depending on your gender, your educational specialism, your age, your seniority within the conservation sector, in other words, your position within conservation, and even your nationality or which continent you come from. Um, and uh, we are particularly interested in the, the African view um, because our course is really focused on Southern Africa or the Southern African context. And um, so, for example, in Africa, conservation is considered more people-centered. Um, and, um, and even... You know, the, the idea of using market forces uh, uh, within the conservation sphere is, is, is generally accepted. Um, albeit that the African um, sample within this, this data set was pretty small, um, it still gives you an idea that, or gives you the understanding that there are different views depending on where you come from around um, conservation. So um, then in the, in the early 2000s, um, the whole issue of leadership really came to the fore and there's, the papers started emerging asking, you know, how should we define leadership in conservation um, or, you know, leadership is a new frontier in conservation science because it was realized that, uh, that leadership is well developed in other fields, um, but not so much um, in conservation, was not given as much thought in conservation. 
um, that maybe it should. And um, the second last um, slide I just want to share is, um, is, is, is the outcome of some of the research that's been done highlighting the kind of skills required um, by conservation leaders in future. And we've sort of highlighted in red and blue, they would be considered to, to be two main areas. The one is uh, interpersonal skills, that, that's quite important, and then few, uh, uh, strategic thinking skills. Um, you can see it there, you know, partnership building, establishing vision, um, you know, strategic planning, conservation planning, systems thinking. These are all um, uh, strategic thinking um, level skills and then, then you've got the interpersonal level skills like conflict management, facilitation skills, mentoring, etc. And then science expertise and research skills is still important but you can see it scores pretty low in terms of, of skill requirements. So this is the context for the design of the, of the program, the new program. Um, so we've developed a, a one-page summary um, with information about the program that is available uh, on the website and we've designed it around five themes uh, which is the conservation governance which is which is really important the policy and legislative context conservation ethics conservation um, uh, psychology um, conservation leadership and, and futures thinking um, and around those five themes we think we've we've designed a unique and relevant master's program um, for individuals uh, working in the field of conservation or anybody that's interested in thinking about the future of conservation and the challenges it presents. So we are, we are um, really excited about this new program and um, uh, I think Rhys can say more about the, the nuts and bolts, but that is just to, to frame the, the mm -hmm. need for the program mm -hmm. and the content of the program. Thank you, Franto. Uh, uh, it's fascinating because once you, you pull leadership into a context, uh, there are so many factors you need to take into consideration, so many influences that, uh, between the different factors. Uh, just for example, what, what's the difference between conservation leadership and futures thinking? So, yeah, um, conservation leadership touches on the, the skills that individuals would need, um, specifically in leadership positions, to make those difficult choices and those difficult trade-offs where the futures thinking provides the context and the paradigms within which those decisions must be taken. Mm. So the futures thinking um, component of the course will allow the students to, to get a better understanding and a better grasp of the, the changing futures and the paradigms within which they as conservation leaders are going to have to make these, these decisions and these mm. calls affecting uh, the conservation outcomes. Mm. Yeah, so, so as you saw that list, those list, that list of skills, so half of those skills would be nested within the ability to apply methodologies that can deal with the future mm. and thinking about the future. And this is, this is the kind of discussion you want with a potential student, right? This is, uh, you, you engage with them uh, in terms of a, 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 a field of interest and so on, and then you explore the theme, define the problem statement, get to a methodology. So Kepi, the, the course is, is designed to be very practical and very hands-on, uh, so much so that um, with the three weeks that the students will be in contact with the, the lecturers, um, the third week will be on site within a, a protected area specifically, um, where the students will then actually get to grapple with practical challenges and issues around futures, uh, thinking scenarios and around conservation leadership challenges uh, for that particular area. So mm -hmm. definitely um, engaging with students, practical, hands-on and, and getting to the nuts and bolts of, of these discussions. So, uh, I'm sorry Franco. We can maybe add that in the design of this course, we did speak with park managers in the field mm. to so do what Greece has just highlighted, is to really make it relevant mm. and practical mm. um, and, and, and in that way make a real difference. Mm. So it's getting the theory linked to the practice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you've mentioned something about three weeks and so on. Is there a contact session? How, yes. how do you present the master's? So if it's a taught master's program uh, structured around three weeks. Uh, so it'll be three contact weeks in year one, and then year two is the research year where the students will then be required to complete their dissertation and write up their, their studies and submit that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it starts with a discussion on the research proposal and then an application, or how does it work? Um, so the students will apply uh, in 2021 for admission in 2022. 
Uh, the final decision will be made in October. It starts with um, a short list, students will be selected and then they'll be informed whether they've made the cut or not um, for, the, for the following year. As I said, the year one is then uh, contact sessions, year two will be the research and it's at the end of year one that the research uh, projects get designed and get discussed with the supervisors. Uh, research proposals then submitted at the end of year one for completion in, in year two. And are you still accepting applications? We are still accepting applications. We are open until the end of October for applications. All right, wonderful. Uh, Francois, just to take us home, uh, what is the value add of this master's degree? Why would anyone without, without this master's want this master's? Yeah, so I think the, the feedback we got from the interviews we did and the research we did um, within South Africa, and also uh, maybe I can just add that we have strong links in Namibia and, and in, the, in the region, so it's definitely a, a regional focus, is that, that the learning outcomes within this program are the challenges faced in practice within conservation with those involved. So, um, so I think the, the level of relevance within this course if you're going to be involved in conservation in the next 50 years, is, is, is really, really strong. Um, and um, yeah, so we, we're really looking forward to this. And, um, and, and, and the feedback has been really good. So we, we've, been, we've, we've got a lot of confirmation from the field that, that the content of this program is, is relevant mm. and, um, and, and useful. So um, I'm really, really looking forward to it. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank I appreciate you. you coming in and good luck with plotting the future yeah. of conservation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks All right, for the opportunity. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard them. A focus on futures thinking and conservation leadership within this unit. Now we make a jump towards climate change and air quality. Up next. Now, the expert from the NWU side, one of the experts, is Professor Rulof Berger. That's, of course, when we start talking about climate change and air quality. And uh, he'll tell us a little bit more about that world and postgraduate options within that world. Rulof, thank you very much for taking the time to be here. And uh, straight off the bat, I can, I can only assume it's a very topical issue, uh, this field of study. Yes, of course, if you, if you watch the news, if you look on the internet, you'll see almost daily mentions of the, the great impact that climate change have on us. And the sometimes very bleak projections. So uh, climate change in general and in other issues like air pollution and uh, our human interaction with the air that we breathe mm. and uh, in, in further the climate and everything that we, uh, that we need to sustain ourselves mm. is the focus of this uh, subject group. Mm. So uh, you work, I can only assume, on an international level where you work with data available internationally, but then also locally. Yes. So uh, the, the, the nature of the problem of climate change, air quality and impacts of uh, these two are dependent on scale. So if you, if you look at the planet as a whole, there's a certain amount of problems that will jump out and the solutions will, that need, that's needed to fix those problems. But then if you zoom in, you look maybe regionally at South Africa, that, that all change. The problems change and then the, the, the things that we need to do change. And then even if you focus even more on a city, then uh, eventually you come up with a whole bunch of new problems. And many times, the solutions are in tension with each other. So it's a really fascinating uh, field of study. Um, and another uh, great thing about our, uh, our research niche at the Northwest University is that the nature of this problem is, is by definition multidisciplinary. And so the fact that we have this unit that has the, the overarching view on environmental sciences make it really nice for us to then link with each of those disciplines, you know. People studying uh, uh, little hojakis and other people studying trees and we looking at how climate might change and how the resilience of these ecosystems will interact in a changing climate is what makes us excited. I think a little bit closer uh, to the postgraduate journey then is how do you collect data? How do you go about in in collecting air quality data? So 
One of the uh, nice things about our university is we have an extensive suite of uh, infrastructure that is available to study these. Uh, we have, for example, a number of uh, air quality stations with very sophisticated uh, equipment where we can measure, for example, the different gases in the atmosphere. Um, then we also have a, a weather radar that we can use to measure the distribution of uh, weather systems at a very high resolution. So that's one uh, uh, pot of data that's available. And then we also have very close collaboration with institutes like the South African Weather Service and then also internationally with uh, places like the NASA and the National Atmospheric uh, Association of, of the USA. So all these makes, makes it really uh, accessible for us to, to get access to the latest and greatest data for our students. And of course, the, the supervisors accompany the, the, I think especially the master's students, I can only assume, uh, on, on these excursions and data collection excursions. Sure. So uh, at a master's level, we typically have a, a more uh, super, uh, stronger supervi supervision and uh, the super supervisors will make, be a, play a very important role in the students collecting the data. But then also, uh, one of the strengths of our research group is we have very st strong uh, externally funded research. Mm. And that research is funded uh, all the way from local governmental agencies to uh, international funding agencies and then private entities, which makes our research very applied. And in those uh, funded research, there's always opportunities for us to get uh, really niche, niche data sets for students to do their degrees. Mm. You said the magic words, funding and, and uh, adversaries and so on. So it's good that you are well funded. Uh, yes. it's, a, it's a great attraction. Yeah, we, uh, we, ha we, we have good uh, f funding opportunities and we do have funding available for students and there's a very uh, strong competition for students to study in our, in our program. Mm. So how does it work? Uh, do they first have to engage with you and, and hash out a theme? Uh, or is it very structured? Well, it? it's not very structured. The most important thing is finding a supervisor. Mm -hmm. um, we have about uh, 10 different uh, supervisors at the Northwest University. And those supervisors each focus on, on, on different disciplines all the way from the social interaction, you know, thinking about how humans and the role that humans play with this problem to the uh, very fundamental chemistry and understanding the chemical reactions in the atmosphere and our human uh, in, in engagement with those chemical reactions. Mm -hmm. So uh, depending on what uh, the, the, the field of interest of the student is, we need to match him with a potential supervisor. Mm -hmm. And then if uh, the, the supervisor is convinced that this will be a great student, then uh, that will be the first step. Mm -hmm. And once the supervisor is on board, um, we start to conceptualize the actual uh, study that the student will do. Mm -hmm. And career-wise, where do your students end up or where do you get your students from? Well, uh, most of our students come through the system, so we... we like uh, full-time students because it, it's uh, easier, you know, postgraduate studies is extremely difficult and therefore you need, it's very few people that can manage that in, on a part-time basis. Mm -hmm. So the, the bulk of our students will come through uh, programs mostly at our university but also from the other universities. But then sometimes if, if, if there's a very uh, driven, motivated students, we do accept uh, uh, part-time uh, programs. So, uh, you know, that's sort of the bulk of the, of the students that we, mm -hmm. that we get through the program. And then uh, after completion, where do they end up? Well, you know, one of the nice things about uh, environmental sciences is there's a, a large migration between disciplines. So uh, you will find our students at almost every sphere of society from the, the current uh, Director General for the, the, uh, the Department of Environmental Affairs and Forestry uh, is one of the, our old students. Um, in the national government, local government, there's quite a few of our existing or old students. 
uh, some in schools you'll find teachers in the big companies ESCOM, Sassel, you'll find mm -hmm. our, our students that's that's there leading the environmental groups mm -hmm. consulting companies uh, there's lots of students working in consulting um, so almost every uh, p potential uh, place for students in the broader environmental sciences you'll find our old mm -hmm. students. Rulof, and uh, are you still accepting applications? Always accepting applications. If it's a good CV and a motivated student, there's always place for yeah. one more. Thank you so much. Professor Rulof Berger, uh, climate change and air quality, I appreciate your time. Ladies and gentlemen, we are jumping from climate change and air quality to aquatic ecosystem health. Ladies and gentlemen, now we focus on aquatic ecosystem health and I have the pleasure of introducing to you Professor Jonathan Taylor. Now I've known Jonathan for quite a while and I know that he does fascinating work and I assume uh, so does his uh, colleagues. Jonathan, thank you so much for availing yourself and uh, uh, telling us a little bit about your world. Let's start first off with a, a basic uh, explanation of what is aquatic ecosystem health. So aquatic ecosystem health is everything to do with aquatic environment. So our group is mainly divided into people who study um, algae, uh, people who study uh, fish health and ecotoxicology, and then those who also have a general interest in microbiology and specifically in the uh, microorganisms that occur in aquatic environments. It sounds very hands-on. So I assume you do a bit of traveling and you have to go to where you find these uh, ecosystems. Yes, yeah. So we've been rather far afield for many field trips. So I worked personally in Zambia for on a nice three-year project. And then we also have a very intensive uh, monitoring program in the Moy River, which is on our doorstep. So we, we monitor water where we find it. Mm. So when a postgraduate student or a potential postgraduate student uh, approaches you, uh, they, I can only assume they need to know a little bit uh, uh, of your world in order to further specialise in your world. Preferably they should have some background in one of the biological sciences, so something like botany, zoology, even geology or geography, um, people can find, or microbiology, people can find a way into um, aquatic ecosystem science. So yeah, so if they have that basic understanding, they should do well in the, in the course. Mm. Jonathan, but your, your focus uh, is not a new one. It, I mean, it's a, it's a scientific field that's been around, I think, perhaps since, since mankind started off. Uh, and, and yet you are still discovering new things. Yes, um, so our field, or my field in particular, where we look at microscopic organisms has been around since the invention of the microscope, which was mm. sort of towards the end of the late 1600s, early 1700s, and people immediately started looking at what was in the water. But it's a, a massively understudied field, so there's a large amount of work still to be done um, on aquatic ecosystems, and uh, there's a lot of exploration still to be done, you know, in, especially in terms of microorganisms, algae, um, even particularly in things like fish behavior, and then growing and developing fields like uh, micro, uh, microbiology and then resistance um, in bacteria to antibiotics, for example, is becoming an area of growing concern. So we have to then start to investigate mm -hmm. these fields as well, which is happening um, within the group. It sounds as if there's a multidisciplinarity involved as well. You can't just focus on, on the biology or the botany. You have to focus perhaps on the fully integrated system. Absolutely. Within aquatic ecosystem health, we have ecotoxicologists. We have fish biologists. We have parasitologists, um, microbiologists, people interested in algae. So a very, very wide uh, or diverse group of people mm. uh, within the sub-program. So tell us a little bit more about the postgraduate programs you have on offer. So our postgraduate program focuses on preparing um, students for a working environment. Uh, so we have, particularly in aqu aquatic ecosystem health, we have uh, a, a wide variety of subjects and streams. So you can choose in which uh, 
stream you would like to be in, uh, strictly in ecotoxicology, for example, or more in biomonitoring. Uh, we have a selection of core modules that the students have to complete. And then after that, they have elective modules. So for example, like um, uh, coral reef ecology, where if they wanted to have a more marine focus, they could then go into that uh, particular uh, stream. That's a surprise, a marine focus at the Northwest University? Yes, there's a very strong uh, group of scientists, the water research group led by uh, Prof. Nico Smith and Prof. Uh, Victor Weppner, um, also with Prof. Corey Walmerantz, and they have a very strong marine focus, especially in parasitology, and have discovered many unique and interesting parasites in the, um, in the marine environment. Mm. Uh, and a, few, a bit more detail, mode of delivery, uh, duration of study, and so on? So we would recommend that the students start out with in the honours program. Um, so for entry to a master's study, we require that they have suitable uh, subjects in their honours degree. So that should be something within the natural sciences and pre preferably within the biological sciences. But as I've said before, we will also look at and try and assist students who have a geographical background, etc. So. Uh, mode of delivery of the honours, we have, as I said, those elective modules and then uh, compulsory modules in the different streams. And then once the student has graduated from honours, um, they would need an average of 65% for the honours module with the research module. And then they would be um, admitted to a master's degree. Once they've completed the master's degree and they wish to continue studying, then they can be admitted to a PhD program and again they would have need to have achieved 65 percent for their master's mm -hmm. uh, degree. And I, I can only think with with the, the blossoming field that you are in, uh, a PhD where you're looking to generate new knowledge, contribute to the body of knowledge, uh, it, it just sounds like a perfect fit. Yeah, so there's, there's so many opportunities even in fields which are um, relatively difficult to get into, like taxonomy, where you're looking at naming and discovering new organisms. There's such a huge scope within algae, within parasites. Um, so there's a lot of, of scope for, for studies within taxonomy, but also within ecology. Um, there is a world-class uh, fish health um, experimental uh, plant at the um, zoological um, department. And they're really doing some groundbreaking work um, on fish health and fish stress in, in that particular um, department. Jonathan, it was nice seeing you again and thank you for your time. Uh, I hope that those students just line up uh, and that they are ready to uh, accompany you on your next trip. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Jonathan. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the interesting world of aquatic ecosystem health uh, and now we're moving on to integrated pest management. Ladies and gentlemen, I can only assume that integrated pest management is something uh, that uh, is required, needed and found in a wide variety of contexts, from agriculture uh, to other environmental uh, areas of study and fields of practice. Uh, luckily, we have an expert here to tell us a little bit more about integrated pest management. Professor Johnny van den Berg joins me. Johnny, thank you so thank much you. for availing yourself. Thank you very much. So, let's start with just what it is. What is integrated pest management? Integrated pest management is managing the environment to suppress pest numbers. You know, not every insect is a pest. And uh, only when their numbers uh, become, be, when, only when they become too abundant is when they become pests and then we need to control them. And we teach our students to manage the environment in such a way that pests don't have outbreaks. And we, we have a very applied way of doing this and teaching students to be functional in a workplace to, to do pest management in an integrated way. Mm. So are we, are we only talking insects or what kind of pests? Oh, uh, we have a lot of expertise at, in the Integrated Pest Management Program. Um, Prof. Tricky Fouri is a world-renowned nematologist. Now, nematodes are very, very small worms that live in the soil that attack the roots of plants. 
and we have a dedicated uh, section in nematology research, and then we have Prof. Annaline Duplessis who works on insecticide resistance management, and Prof. Oriel Takiswe works on zoonosis, which is becoming more and more important nowadays because zoonosis describes diseases that attacks man that comes from animals, uh -huh. like COVID. I can see the relevance. Yes, <laughs> so integrated pest, you can now talk about integrated pest and virus management if you want to. So, uh, and then we work in mostly all, all those disciplines uh, come together in managing huge agroecological systems to suppress pest numbers. Mm -hmm. So that's the space we work in. And as I've, I've said at the, at the offset, um, I, th I think the name says it all, integrated. So we're not speaking just agriculture. Yeah, we, we're not talking agriculture. And very interesting, something that people don't often think about, uh, our garden pests and our household pests, you know, in the kitchen cupboard and in the garage or a few rodents, that's also integrated pest management. Mm. But in our context, uh, we talk more in, in terms of the integrated, we talk about using different um, concepts to manage pests. For example, um, I always talk about the four pillars of integrated pest management. The one is using plants that are resistant to pests. So plants defend themselves. Then you can use chemical control to kill the pests. And you can use biological control, you know, natural enemies like ladybirds and parasitic wasps to kill the pest. And you can use some cultivation practices like conservation agriculture to suppress pest numbers. And integrating that is what we talk about as integrated pest management, using every tool in the book mm. to manage and suppress a pest. Because you can't eradicate a pest. Mm. You can only manage it. Mm. And are we seeing new uh, approaches develop? I, I don't know if mm. new pests evolve. Oh, we see, uh, we see very, very interesting things. I think we, we get about one serious new insect pest per year that comes from outside of South Africa that can, that can cause millions of dollars worth of damage. Mm. Um, and new techniques, um, new insecticides are being developed. We come up with new strategies. People breed plants that are resistant to the new pests. And then, of course, uh, something which we are also very strong in, in the IPM program, is dealing with genetically modified crop species, that the plants are modified um, with a foreign gene in them to produce a toxin that will kill these invasive mm. pests. So we also teach our students to use genetically modified plants in an integrated pest management system, mm. because if you use that, you do not spray as much insecticides, which protects the environment, which protects natural enemies, which is integrating mm, all these right principles. Back to the integration yes. component. Yes. Uh, so you'll always have new topics to explore. You'll always have students coming in with new ideas, right, on a postgraduate level. Yes, yes. And you know, uh, the interesting thing, students will come um, in October, November of the year and say, w do you have a research topic, new pest or pest for next year for us to research on? And I would say no. Contact me in January because the new pests always arrive in December. <laughs> so there's always something new. There's always something new to discover. And I think it's a very exciting field to do research in. Mm. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the postgraduate qualifications you have on offer. We, we have the BSc Honours in Environmental Sciences with Integrated Pest Management, IPM. Um, and for that, we take students that did their graduate studies in, a biologic, in biological sciences. Uh, students that are most fitted in the program are those that have botany, microbiology, and zoology, which then enter the honors level. And in the, in the, in the BSc honors uh, academic modules, we have modules such as the principles of IPM, um, economic threshold level and decision support systems, and the use of genetically modified crops in an IPM context, and nematodes and their management, and insect-plant interactions. So those are the honors modules, as well as a very big research project. 
And from that onwards, a student with a master's advances to a specific project which um, will involve a new pest and sorting out its biology and control um, strategies. And we have a dedicated laboratory, which is the only one in the country, where we um, screen for insecticide resistance um, of several pest species. You know, farmers uh, complain regularly that ins insecticide doesn't work anymore. And then we go and collect and go through a stringent scientific process and really evaluate if it's genetic resistance or was it poor application methods mm -hmm. or water quality that was the problem or something. Mm -hmm. So, so um, th those are the things we do in the master's program with a lot of support from um, the farming sector and uh, multinational seed companies and so on. So that's the space we work in. And the PhD? The PhD, uh, we, we have a PhD, uh, quite a few PhD. We have, a, a, I would say, 70% of the PhDs we, uh, we, that went through the IPM program over the past 10 years were outside of South Africa, um, from other African countries that joined us and registered here mm. to, to work with us as supervisors. Um, so uh, that for us is a highlight, but for the PhD, a student would usually focus on a specific pest and a specific management um, challenge. For example, um, looking at the genetics of the evolution of resistance to a specific insecticide or the genetic evolution of resistance to a genetically modified cotton variety or something. And uh, our foreign students uh, very, very interesting projects on um, malaria and uh, landscape-wide management of pests through push and pull systems where we plant different plant species next to each other or next to maize, for example, and then we kind of fool the pest to choose the wrong plant to lay eggs on. Yeah. Um, and and th that is, again, integrating some novel knowledge that you gather through a PhD on how to divert the moth to make a wrong choice when she selects a maize host plant, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that's the type of projects our PhD does. Mm. Are you still accepting applications? Yes, we are, and uh, uh, up to the end of the year, and um, students with backgrounds in agriculture, but also um, students that did entomology at other universities, entomology, plant pathology, nematology, or microbiology and zoology and botany, all the biological sciences can really apply. And we have exciting prospects for young students. And we, we teach them and we bring them into contact with the farming community and the industry that supports the farming community in South mm. Africa. And, and job opportunities seem, well, good. Mm. Now you're touching on, on the relevance of the degree uh, and uh, I think there's a, a, a broader relevance to the greater humanity, mm. is it not, within your field? It, it, I, I, I can assume mm. you, you can make an immediate impact, but generally speaking. Yeah. Well, I think if, if, there's, if there's one word that you can use to, as the basis for everything mm. I've just said is food security. Mm. Um, so, so that is... That is what we address, actually. Um, and then also, you know, the, uh, throughout the world, there's a movement, uh, a move away from um, chemical control of everything, pests and weeds and many other things, uh, towards more organic agriculture and insecticides, and insecticides are banned throughout the world, so many of them, so the options are limited. And I think then also the integrated pest management work that we do to support uh, crop production without some of those pesticides mm. it adds to human health in, uh, in, uh, improvements. You know, so so we have a very wide impact. Although we can eventually say I'm an entomologist, I work with insects, but I know the impact of that is very wide. Mm. Professor Johnny van den Berg, thank you so much for your time uh, and for allowing us a glimpse into your world. Thank you very much. Right, now ladies and gentlemen, that was integrated pest management and uh, it forms a part of the unit for environmental sciences and management.
Thank you so much for taking the time and do contact us if you'd like to know more. We have a lot of information available for you on the Northwest University's website, www.nwu.ac.za. For over 30 years, the Northwest University has played an important role in the training of environmental managers. The Unit for Environmental Sciences and Management offer a Master's in Environmental Management that is presented by leading experts in the field. The Master's Program in Environmental Management has evolved over the past 30 years as the leading environmental management program in the country. It's a two-year part-time program that consists of a taught and a research component. Year one deals with the taught component where we focus on different environmental management approaches and instruments. The approaches we look at are command and control, fiscal based, civil based and agreement based approaches. And then the two instruments we focus on are environmental impact assessment and environmental management systems. Now we apply these approaches and instruments to different environmental sectors like air, water, biodiversity, and then also sectors like waste management, energy, climate change, etc. We do, however, recognize that the environmental management issues we face are cross-cutting. So the theoretical basis for the thought component relies on systems thinking and complexity theory to ensure that the students require the skill of integrated thinking to deal with integrated issues. So although we apply the different approaches and instruments to specific sectors, in the end, we do require integrated thinking to deal with the issues we face. The research component happens in year two, and the research component really focuses on the performance of these different environmental management approaches and instruments. So we ask the question whether they are working and whether they are adding value. The reason I really registered for this course is because I knew that um, it is actually all I need in order for me to be one of the best environmental officers. This is really the pinnacle of my learning career. I completely, thoroughly enjoyed it. For me, what it has done is it has given me like an in-depth understanding um, about the things that, which I may not do on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, the wonderful part of this course is that we have to do a dissertation as well as the coursework. So we get the academic baseline and then we get to apply it in a field of our interest. We do expect our students to publish their research in peer-reviewed journals and also present their research at international and local conferences. So if you are a mid-career professional with an honours degree working in the environmental field, we invite you to join us to find solutions to our key environmental management challenges in South Africa. With the promulgation of the new Water Act in 1998, a whole range of tools were developed to implement this legislation. When the Department of Water Affairs and Forestry at that stage did a skills audit, they realized that there was virtually no capacity to implement these different tools. A whole range of scientists in South Africa were contacted to develop course material to train both practitioners in the water sector as well as managers of the water sector with the implementation of all of these tools. This resulted in the development of a curriculum to enact ecological water requirements. The master's program that we present here at the Northwest University is a combination of all of the different modules that were developed in order to train both the practitioners in water resources management as well as the managers in water resources management. A Master's in Environmental Management with specialization in ecological water requirements is comprised of two theory modules presented in the first year and one research module that's presented in the second year. 
The two theory modules presented in the first year is comprised of the ecological drivers of the aquatic ecosystem, mainly geomorphology, water quality and hydrology. The ecological responses presented in the second theory module of the first year comprises of the biological components such as fish, macroinvertebrates, riparian vegetation and diatoms. Since its inception three years ago, the Masters in Ecological Water Requirements has been popular for both public services professionals working in the water sector as well as from the private sector working with various water related issues in South Africa. This degree will provide you with valuable theoretical knowledge surrounding ecological water requirements, but also very practical knowledge about how to implement ecological water requirements within the various industries that you might come from. Furthermore, this master's will allow you to have contact with industry professionals in the ecological water requirements sector, already practicing what you will receive during the various theoretical and practical aspects of this course. Coming here, it actually has given me more tools. It's more practical. The content of the course is very relevant because my background is hydrology and geohydrology, and I feel it is more advancing. I was completely blown away because of the type of lectures that we have. They're very knowledgeable. They're specialists in the related field of study, whether it be surface water, groundwater, water quality, the teacher's theory that puts into practice. I mean, I learned a lot. The Unit for Environmental Sciences and Management offers a Master's in Environmental Management with specialization in water resource management. This curriculum was put together by experts in the field. We look forward to receiving your applications for the Masters in Ecological Water Requirements here at Northwest University. Within the Unit for Environmental Sciences and Management, a Master's in Environmental Management is offered that specializes in waste management. This is a unique specialization. This degree is the only degree of its kind currently presented and offered in South Africa and provides prospective students and people currently working in the waste sector with a unique opportunity to skill themselves in the requirements of integrated waste management. This program consists of two taught and one research component. The two taught modules has one module in integrated waste management, which focuses on the everyday issues when it comes to integrated waste management, such as illegal dumping, unauthorized management and disposal of waste, and also finding innovative solutions to address the everyday waste problems that we are facing. The second module focuses on waste-related law and governance, where we focus on teaching the students the waste-related strategies, regulations, and the legislation. In the second year, we present the research component, which has a small taught component where we teach the students how to write up their methodology, the literature review, etc. At the end of that year, they need to submit a mini dissertation as an outcome of this degree. The lecturers here at the Institute are absolutely brilliant. They are so knowledgeable in terms of the expertise, knowledge. We've got a well-rounded team of lecturers that is here to educate and empower us. I would encourage everybody to do it from all sectors. You don't necessarily have to be in the waste management sector to do it. You need to get the knowledge. With the amount of challenges that the municipalities are encountering in terms of waste management, this course could just break ground and make products of such people who will bring about change in terms of waste management. Waste management and the issues related to waste is a global problem. Our program has been developed to be solutions driven and also provide students with an opportunity to get to engage and know the legislation applicable to waste management. We are looking forward to you joining us on this journey to finding innovative solutions to the waste issues that we are currently facing.
Ladies and gentlemen, every time I talk to people at the Indigenous Knowledge Systems Centre at our Maikeng campus, I am impressed. They do incredible work, fascinatingly interesting work, uh, and luckily we are here today to learn a little bit more about what they do and the postgraduate degrees on offer. We're talking to Professor Uludapu Aremu, and he is from the IKS Center in Mahikeng. Professor, thank you so much for joining us and availing yourself. Tell us a little bit more about the center and the work that you do. Okay, no, thank you very much. And it's always interesting to come back to this platform. So when we talk about IKS Center, it's one of the five consortium partners institution that was formed by Department of Science and Innovation. We are part of those five universities that include University of Limpopo, University of KwaZulu-Nata, University of South Africa, and University of Venda. So these five partners are supposed to pursue IKS knowledge in South Africa. And when we talk about IKS, it means everything we do every day. Is it about the way we uh, plant our food, uh, the way we do our science and technology? So it revolves about everything about our lives. So in this IKS center, we are focusing on specific areas. For example, indigenous agriculture is one of the streams we have in the IKS center. We have indigenous science and technology. We have indigenous languages. We have indigenous art and culture. And under these major teams, we also have issue about cultural diversity with African indigenous law. So anything you can study in the conventional courses are actually available in the IKS center. When you look at things like, how do we treat people? That's where the indigenous medicinal plant come into being. Uh, when we talk about the healthcare system, there are ways people do it. So the whole purpose of the IKS center is to actually show the value in indigenous knowledge system. And we are actually open for business for m and Ds. In the terms of the m and Ds, we have our MIKS, which is the master's program, which is for two years, and we have the PhD, which is for three years. Thank you. Prof, so that uh, master's degree, is it a structured one with modules or is it a full dissertation? Okay, for the master's degree, it's a full dissertation. Uh, you come in, you so uh, you think about a problem just like we do in other uh, departments. You define a problem, you'll be allocated a supervisor who is going to guide you. So for two years, you are supposed to write your proposal. You go to the field and do research, you write up your results. So within two years, you should be able to complete that master's uh, in IKS. And as I mentioned, we cover practically all field. You can decide to look ab uh, about indigenous uh, plants. You can look at indigenous planting system. So whichever area whereby you can define a problem, identify a problem, you can actually come here and do the research in the IKS center. I like the idea that, uh, you know, you are so open to accept people from different uh, disciplines uh, entering into the master's program. Uh, do you have specific admission requirements, like a, 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 an average that needs to be, uh, be need to be there from an undergraduate level? Yes. Uh, let me start from this point. Our own uh, undergraduate program is actually four years, so we don't do the three years grand ones or not. It's a four year straight. So people that are from uh, the undergraduate stream that have done a four year, they are eligible to come for a master's. So likewise, if you're coming from, maybe for example, you're coming from botany, which is a three years, we expect you to have done your honors. So you have to have an honors degree or BIKS degree from any of the partners institution like uh, University of Limpopo, University of Venda, University of South Africa. So from that uh, BIKS, which is a four year program or honors degree, you'll be eligible to come into uh, a master's degree in IKS Center. Uh, professor, Thank you. And, uh, professor, are you still accepting applications now? Yes, we follow the central system. So once the central system is opened, you apply to the central system, your application will be submitted, 
it will be assessed by the uh, staff members and based on uh, the research, you'll be allocated someone. Also, you're also uh, very open to speak to uh, lecturers that you might have read their papers. So it's actually more, uh, it's easier for you to get admission once you've established contamination with such staff members, because the staff member will be able to tell you that, why don't you look at this? The staff member will be able to give you guidance. So we are still open. We follow the NWU central system. Well, Dalpu, now I know that uh, uh, just one last word on, on the study of indigenous knowledge. I know that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very topical field even within the international arena, right? People are looking more and more towards uh, studying indigenous knowledge. Am I right? You are very correct. Because we actually think the problem can be solved by looking back, because there's always been problem and people have overcome it. So when we talk about IKS, we, we actually refer to ourselves as multidisciplinary. It means if you have a problem, you don't just look at it with a, uh, a single lens. You look at it from different facets to see this is a problem. As a natural scientist, how do you see the problem as a social scientist? That's the way IKS operate. We always say IKS is holistic. It means you look at if someone is sick, you don't just say, okay, do you have a headache? You look at it holistically. Maybe there is some cultural or spiritual uh, effect. You look at it that way. So that's the way IKS operate. And as I said, things like art architecture, <laughs> you can actually do it in master's level. You look at the building materials. Why is it that it's more environmental friendly? And in fact, when we talk about IKS, our research actually speaks to national policies like the NDP, National Development Plan of South Africa. We are not just national based. We also speak to Africa, African Union Agenda 2063, which is the national policy for the African continent. We don't stop there. We all know about the United Nations SDG, uh, the Sustainable Development Goal. Our research speaks to all these angles. So our research is actually uh, relevant and it actually contributes because when we talk about SDG, for example, we want to solve the issue of food, secure, in food, food insecurity. It means we look at it from an indigenous perspective. What are the benefits of indigenous food? So you can see that there is no how that in the IKS can be neglected even for international policy. As you said, we are, a topic that uh, we, we are operating a topic that is relevant nationally, uh, African-based and internationally. Thank you. Professor Aludapu Aremu, I really appreciate it. I love the work that you do. Uh, and thank you so much for your time. If I can, sorry, if I can just add one word, I just also want to give the potential students some reason why I think they must come to the IKS Center. This is, a topic, IKS is now uh, recognized nationally, internationally. So you even stand a better chance of getting funding. You stand a better chance of doing a holistic research because you'll be able to engage with the knowledge holders. We have a lot of partners currently. Knowledge holders, we also have partners institution, people like Agricultural Research Council. We have the CSIR. These are national research platform. So the center actually allows you and give you that platform to be able to do a research that will be impactful. That at the, end, at the end of the day, you'll be able to tell your grandmother how you contribute to the knowledge because the knowledge is relatable. So those are just some of the two points I also want to highlight that you stand a better chance of getting funded because the government actually are funding research that are IKS based. Once again, and I must not forget, you also have a group of researchers. The staff members are very hardworking. So you have people who support you right from the point you enter into the system all to the graduation. We are very open. We are very approved. And I can promise you, you will not regret coming for a postgraduate degree in IKS Center. Thank you. Thank you so much, Holodop. We love your passion. And uh, thank you for highlighting those <coughs> important issues. Uh, when it comes to uh, indigenous knowledge systems and the studies uh, that we have within that field. Thank you so much.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, next up we're going to speak to Professor Olubukula Babalola. Uh, she is, of course, the research director uh, for the niche area for food uh, safety and security. Uh, I know her quite well. We've done a lot of work together, and I know that her field is, uh, is such an interesting field. She does a lot of work as well for women in science. So, Professor Babalola, it's a wonderful honor to again uh, share the screen with you. Good day. Good day. Thank you, Van. Uh, Professor, uh, let's start with the niche area. Tell us a little bit more about the work that you do in food safety and security. Yeah, thank you. In the food security and safety research entity, the entity actually was established um, back in 2009 when the, the need for such an important group was discovered. The niche area, we actually call it niche area now, the niche area encompasses a broad research in uh, food security and safety. And when you say food security and safety, you are talking about something that is mouthful in terms of the research that it encompasses. So uh, in it, we have a crop food production and the availability. We also have the animal food production and availability. We have uh, food affordability and accessibility. We have food safety as well as uh, food and climate change. So those are the areas that our work revolves about. And when it comes to uh, postgraduate studies, uh, uh, do you offer postgraduate courses or focal areas within all those fields that you've mentioned? Yeah, um, thank you. You see, the key issues in uh, food security and safety relates to part of what I've earlier mentioned in terms of uh, having the food available, having access to the food, uh, in terms of the utilization of the food itself. So when you talk about um, postgraduate um, students in this area, the research entity earns research to improve food security. So we focus on the contribution of the agricultural system to household food security, even in the face of climate change. So when I said agricultural systems, I mean uh, food production, food marketing, food processing, uh, I mean the value uh, adding to food. I mean the technology it encompasses as well as the consumption. So when we bring in uh, learners into these research areas, they investigate on all the different components without leaving out the aspect of food safety. Um, Investigation on food safety and the application of um, bacteria to use it in form of biofertilizer because we don't want to damage the environment is part of what we do as a packing. So the research deals with both the technical and the socioeconomic dynamics of food security and the, um, the strategies for sustainability to improve the productivity of this crop and the livestock as well are all embedded in what we, the, the knowledge that we transfer to our postgraduate student. So you will see we have a training of um, masters, even honors, um, masters 
um, PhDs, not only that, we also train um, postdoctoral uh, fellows. And all these are the things that underpin our agenda as a food security and safety niche area. So the research um, focus emphasizes the role of even indigenous food system to household food security. So anything about uh, food security is uh, as a package is what we handle under the different uh, sub programs that we have, if I may mention them, again, the food crop um, production, animal food production, food affordability, food safety, food and climate change. Now, Professor, uh, I, I, I love hearing about the full array, you know, all the, the different postgraduate qualifications from honours to the postdocs. Uh, and I know that it takes a, 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 a very competent team to uh, offer these postgraduate programs um, and uh, you have such a team. Uh, I think it's a, it's a large team, so it's difficult to talk about everything that they do and highlight all their work, but uh, tell us a little bit more about your team of experts. Okay, um, to just give a foundation about the team of experts, our vision is that the entity will become a leading research and development center in the area of food security and safety. And for that reason, we have broad range of expertise. What I'm trying to say is that in all the, each, in each of the sub program of food security and safety, we have a champion, someone that is leading each subgroup to the extent that in each subgroup, it is not just the person leading it. We have other professors and um, doctors that are teaming up with, with the leader of each subgroup so that we can give the best to our learners. Take for example, if you pick the area of crop food production and availability, we have professors um, in that team, and the, the team also have, uh, in fact, all the subgroup um, expertise, they have NRF rated uh, scientists. And we also have not only the internal uh, expertise that we enjoy as a university, we also have extraordinary professors and extraordinary staff teaming up with us and these extraordinary staff are scattered all over the world. Our expertise also include the huge collaboration that we have with diverse universities home and abroad. We have um, uh, these expertise, um, the research scientists, they bring in a lot of research grants to support the learners. So we have uh, adequate facility for food security and safety. So our expertise is not only in terms of human resources alone, we have it in form of the capital available on ground. And by the way, I can also take pride in the uh, new massive greenhouse that um, will be erected now on the Mafeking campus, all to buttress what we want to give to our learners. So the expertise that we have, we have them in form of scientists that are crop scientists. We have uh, geographers, animal scientists, um, molecular microbiologists, animal health scientists, agri-extension scientists, agronomists, and even biotechnology experts like myself. So uh, a number of us are also NRF rated. So we can guarantee that our learners are in safe hand and that um, we will give them the best possible that they can find anywhere in the world. 
Thank you, Professor. Professor Babalola, let's get into uh, some of the details and the logistics when it comes to the higher degrees, the masters and the PhDs. Uh, tell us a little bit more about things like mode of delivery and site of delivery and, and duration of study and so on. Thank you. We have a diploma. We have a, a master's uh, in agriculture. We have master of um, biology. We have master of science, master of geography. In all these also, we have the doctoral degree that we offer. The mode of delivery is face-to-face um, -face and we have not uh, relented because of COVID. We are up to task. We also quickly adapted to online delivery of our lectures. So we have now both the face-to-face -face and the online delivery of our lectures. And uh, our structure is in form of um, master's dissertation, PhD, thesis, and don't be surprised, a number of our learners are publishing because they have access to good facilities, access to great experts in the field and exposure, and all those are really open. The duration of the study depends on whether you come in for um, diploma, for honors, masters, or PhD. The minimum for the PhD is um, three years, um, and they do good hands-on research. is purely pure research, no um, lecture in that one. Um, most of our masters are also pure research. At the honors level, you do both um, research and you attend the uh, theory, theoretical classes as well. So the, uh, if I may also talk about the application, it's very easy to you. Uh, website is user friendly. If you get online and then um, the information is well available there and it's very user friendly. So as I'm using this opportunity to encourage um, all learners interested in making sure that the world does not go hungry to come and study with us, the process is very simple and each stage in order, everything is well explained online at our website nwu.ac dot um z e so um i think i should leave it like that so, uh, thank you professor babalola and thank you so much uh, for the work that you do and for the time that you have given us today good luck with your work in future thank you for having me and i'm hopeful that saying considering the issue of the SDG go that uh, a lot of learners we take up this challenge and together we can make uh, the world to be food secure. Northwest University is a place to be. Thank you. Indeed, thank you very much, Professor Babalala. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the niche area for food safety and security.